Good afternoon, honorable members. Honorable members, when the business of this house suspended for lunch, the honorable member for Baines and Grantstown had reserved the podium. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bain and Grantstown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> New Eras, for 481 years ago, the rediscovery of this family of islands, rocks, and keys herald the rebirth of the new world. And whereas the people of this family of islands recognizing that the preservation of their freedom will be guaranteed by a national commitment to self-discipline, industry, loyalty, unity, and an abiding respect for Christian values and the rule of law. Now know ye therefore, we the inheritors of and successors to this family of islands, recognizing the supremacy of God and believing in the fundamental rights and freedom of the individual, do hereby proclaim in solemn praise the establishment of a free and democratic sovereign nation founded on spiritual values in which no man, <coughs> woman, or child shall ever be slave or bondsman <coughs> to anyone or their labor exploited or their lives frustrated by deprivation and do hereby provide by these articles for the indivisible unity and creation under God of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. <clears throat> preamble <clears throat> to the Commonwealth, preamble to the Constitution. Thank you. <laughs> May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thine sight. May it please this honorable house, Mr. Speaker, it is with immense humility and gratitude that I rise on behalf of the noble people of Bain and Grandstown, and as Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism and Aviation, to second this compendium of bills and to impart my contribution to the legislation being debated in this honorable house. I should like to take this honorable house of assembly on an aviation journey. And by the time I have completed my contribution in this honorable house, each of you members of parliament will be, will be well aware of what the pilot is saying over the radio. The next time you jump on a charter flight, going to a family island. For this lesson and for my contribution, I should like to use the illusion as if we are flying in a Cessna 172. Lesson one, in aviation, after a plane pre-flight and ready to depart the ramp for a taxi to take off, the pilot will get the ATIS information which is the automatic terminal information system. It is a continuous broadcast of recorded aeronautical information, primarily regarding weather. And each ATIS recorded has a phonetic letter attached to it, which the pilot would use to confirm that he heard the ATIS information for that current time frame. I will use C as in Charlie for this contribution. <laughs> Lesson one. Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas being an archipelago of 700 islands and keys, 
with 17 major inhabited islands, is no stranger to the aviation industry. Since the invention of the first successful airplane flight in 1903 by Wilbur and Orville Wright, known as the Wright Brothers, the aviation industry has skyrocketed the heights unimaginable. And similarly, rules and regulations of the air, standards and recommendation and aviation best practices became more paramount as passenger flights became the more preferred mode of transportation because of convenience. It was in 1944 when the Convention on International Civil Aviation, best known as the Chicago Convention, established the International Civil Aviation Organization, ICAO. And ICAO became the specialized agency of the United Nations with responsibility to coordinate international air travel. Its core mandate then, as today, was to help the member states to achieve the highest possible degree of uniformity in civil aviation regulations, standards, procedures, and organization. This core mandate of ICAO, Mr. Speaker, is why we meet today to get our aviation host, or should I say our aviation plane, in order. These bills represent a continuation of heavy lifting needed to regularize and create a uniform harmony for, av for aviation regulations in the Bahamas. As a country, Mr. Speaker, we are one out of 192 member states of ICAO. And as a result, to ensure that each member state is following the same regulations and standards in principle, the organization conducts various audits of each state. And as was mentioned, the Bahamas' last audit on October 23rd through November 3rd of 2017 saw the downgrade of our effective impl implementation, our EI score, from 56.98% to 31.98%. This score, Mr. Speaker, does not accurately reflect the genius of the Bahamas. It is beneath the capability of our outstanding aviation professionals, and it sure doesn't provide an incentive or confidence for investors to consider investing in the Bahamas' aviation industry. These bills will address that concern. Lesson two, the pilot will contact clearance delivery, and in this case, being at the Linden Penland International Airport, clearance delivery is on 118.3. The pilot would say, Nassau clearance, November 54360, requesting VFR, which is visual flight rules, to the northeast with information Charlie. Nassau clearance will then tell the pilot, to contact ground control. Mr. Speaker, ICAO's evaluation spoke to eight high priority items, which essentially covers three aviation areas. I am pleased today, Mr. Speaker, that this compendium of bills will rectify ICAO's concerns and subsequently elevate the Bahamas' effective implementation score. I am equally pleased, Mr. Speaker, that the outstanding aviation team who worked hard day and night drafting and editing these bills did their due diligence by hiring the experts in the industry as consultants and conducting the wide range of industry and stakeholder consultation meetings. The safety of our aviation sector is not a biased one and certainly not a political one. We can all agree that the continued development of aviation in the Bahamas bodies well for all Bahamians. The safety and security of passengers, airmen, and aircraft in our jurisdiction is a matter of high priority, and it cannot be delayed nor denied. In November of this year, 2021, ICAO is set to lead an ICAO Coordination Validation Mission, ICVM, 
to the Bahamas to follow up on previously stated concerns that needed to be addressed to review the proficiency of our effective implementation. Today, everyone under the sound of my voice is witnessing the readying of our aviation industry by our deliberation and subsequent passing of these bills. Lesson three, when the pilot contacts Nassau ground on 121.7, the pilot would say, Nassau ground, November 54360 is at Jet Aviation ready to taxi with information Charlie. Nassau ground would say, for example, November 54360, runway 90 via Sierra, Foxtrot, Lima, complete run up, advised run up complete. And then the pilot would repeat that same information back to the ground control, ending with the call signal, November 54360. Mr. Speaker, I speak now to the first of three bills, the Civil Aviation Bill. This bill is the official document that governs aviation in the Bahamas. It's, it sets out the rules and regulations for engaging in an aviation sector of our country. This bill that everyone, this is the bill that everyone who wishes to do business in aviation will refer to, to understand the requirements and the route that one will take to obtain various licenses and permits to do business at large. It tells you what penalties will be, what penalties, it tells you what your penalties will be if you break the laws and policies relating to the Bahamas' aviation sector. Additionally, this operating document points you to the correct direction of the authority that has oversight for various operating procedures. For example, the Civil Aviation Bill has now placed the issuance of the, air of the air transport license under the careful watch of the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas. The bill has substantially increased the penalty cost from 10,000 to a maximum of 100,000 for anyone who breaches aviation laws or policies in the Bahamas. This was noted as a concern, Mr. Speaker, from the last audit conducted by ICAO to serve as a severe deterrence to anyone who think to break the law and to get a mere slap on the wrist. Aviation is serious business, both safety and financially. No one should be able to challenge our laws and get away with it. We are beefing up and strengthening our nation's ability to seek proper remuneration in those instances. Everyone, Mr. Speaker, everything concerning aviation with regards to its powers and functions can be found in our civil aviation bill being proposed today. Lesson four, after the pilot completes his run up in the airplane, he will then advise Nassau Tower, November 54360, run up complete, holding short runway Nina Sierra, ready for departure. Nassau Tower would reply, November 54360, line up and wait. And then the pilot will repeat the instructions ending with the call sign 360. He will proceed onto the runway and line up and wait for takeoff. Mr. Speaker, the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas Bill donates this body as an enforcer of the rules and regulations outlined in the Civil Aviation Bill. It has the complete oversight of aviation in the Bahamas as it works with other governing bodies and stakeholders for common goals and purposes. Recently, this honorable house passed a bill to establish the Air Accident Investigation Authority, which was also a, a which was also to achieve ICAO standard and to allow for greater accountability and transparency. This Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas will work with the Air Accident Investigation Authority along with other agencies for connected purposes. Training and development will be a pivotal arm of this authority, ensuring that our professionals in the industry are equipped with the latest technology and machinery 
to effectively carry out the assignments, to effectively carry out their assignments, which will be a vital part of the work of the authority. We know it all too well, Mr. Speaker, what happens when government agencies are ill-equipped to render proficient services to the general public. Revenue declines, corruption sets in, productivity plummets. This cannot be the fate of our aviation sector. This bill will assist greatly in ensuring that the highest degree of due care and attention is given to the consistently ever-evolving demand of aviation. ICAO's report also spoke to the outdated aviation policies that did not keep pace with the changing standards and rec regulations. A more efficient method of creating policies and operating procedures was noted as a matter of high priority. We tackled this concern, Mr. Speaker, with the introduction of the Director General of Aviation made operating regulations. The intent behind the granting of power to the Director General of Aviation to make operating regulations is to eradicate the backlog of pending aviation matters that need approval. The original bill required that any such adjustments being made to the Civil Aviation Act be brought to the cabinet, then to the parliament for debate, then the Senate, and subsequent passing. Even if the, amend the amendment was straightforward as increasing the height by which an airplane can fly over any obstacle by 1,000 from 1,000 feet to 1,500 feet above. These kinds of policies and regulation regulatory changes that are technical should be under the remit of the Director General of Aviation to expedite such technical adjustments for the proficiency and efficiency of the industry. To be clear, Mr. Speaker, this change to the Director General made operating regulations in no way limits or evades the office of the minister with responsibility for aviation, as he or she will still have the unfettered ability to revoke and or direct as necessary in writing any changes made by the Director General in the name of the Crown. Aviation continues to evolve daily, and we in the Bahamas must be ready at any moment in time to move swiftly to enact the kinds of legislations that will protect our people, sovereignty, and our industry. Another unique implementation embodied in the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas Bill is the creation of the Search and Rescue Coordination Center. This new body, if nothing else, Mr. Speaker, every Bahamian can perhaps have a great appreciation, appreciation for. We have heard and seen the horror so stories of fatal crash landings in our jurisdiction. We, as a body, can ill afford to turn a blind eye towards the urgent need for such a coordinating center. Bahamians travel every day via air transport from island to island throughout the Bahamas. Our armed forces, both the Royal Bahamas Defense Force and Police Force, having the ability to coordinate efforts with the Air Accident Investigation Authority and the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas is simply like a dream come through. Safety and security is the bedrock of aviation. And that is why we say in aviation, Mr. Speaker, no matter what happens, fly the plane. No matter what happens, fly the, the plane. So if you're flying, in this case, uh, a, a single engine plane, Mr. Speaker, and depending on the high safe altitude that you're at, your survival will be pre-dedicated on A, B, C, D, E. A, airspeed. The pilot would pitch the plane to the best glide airspeed, which will allow the plane to have the stable descent, but the, the 
greater distance of travel. B, the pilot will have time to pick a best landing place, whether it's on, on, on sea or on land. C, the pilot will use his checklist, and every pilot knows what a checklist is, and he will refer to the section that addresses single engine uh, outage and try to reboot that airplane. D, that pilot will declare. He will contact the tower control and he will squawk on his radar 7700, which we know is the in-flight emergency. And once the pilot have done that and made contact with tower, he would prepare his exits, unlock the doors and unlock the windows. So if the plane makes a crash as he prepare and his passengers prepare and brace for impact, if one of the doors are smashed on one side, the other doors and windows are already open so they could make good their escape. But Mr. Speaker, there is a box in the plane that is called the ELT, the Emergency Locator Transmitter. Once that goes off, it sends a signal on a frequency that alerts the, author the authority that a plane has just crashed and it emits your location on the radar. This is where it becomes critical, Mr. Speaker, because the time between a crash and the arrival of the search and rescue team will be the difference between life and death. And this is why this search and rescue coordination center is so vitally important. We must be able to act swift, to act swiftly at any moment in time to any emergency. And the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas bill amplifies our efforts and increase the manpower and coordination in conjunction with the Air Accident Investigation Authority. The third bill, Mr. Speaker, being debated in this honorable house today, speaks to the Bahamas Air Navigation Service Authority. The original bill has the Navigational Service as a division within the old Bahamas Civil Aviation Authority. They are going from a division to a standalone entity with its own regulations and rules that will govern that will govern it along with its own governing structure. This is particularly needed to alleviate any ambiguity and concerns documented in ICAO's report. Transparency and accountability within the aviation industry of the Bahamas body well for the greater development and advancement of an advancement of the same. One particular advancement is the Bahamas' outstanding progress towards collecting overflight fees for our sovereign airspace. The Bahamas Air Navigational Service Authority is being empowered with the legislative ability to charge and collect those fees. And as we empower our navigational services to go beyond just land coverage into elevation overseas, we will thereby increase and expand our, ter our territory, our territorial coverage, and increase revenue projections. Mr. Speaker, I should also like to note that the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority not only have the right to charge such fees, but by the power invested in them, they can also put a lien against any aircraft that violates our rules and regulations and ground such plane as necessary. The Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority also work along with the AAIA, as well as the Search and Rescue Coordination Center for connected purpose, purposes seamlessly. Lesson six, Mr. Speaker, as I bring my contribution to a close. Once Nassau Tower has cleared other planes within the immediate area, they call back to the plane on the runway and give instructions. November 54360, make left downwind, clear for departure. The pilot would repeat the instructions, ending with the call sign, November 54360, and take off. Mr. Speaker, the development of more airports throughout our family islands 
particularly in Long Island. Well, the good member for Long Island has been agitating in the Ministry of Tourism and Aviation for quite some time to have. It's critical to the advancement of transport and for connecting people and destination. The overhaul needed to upgrade, renovate, and build new airports require a significant economic investment. Moreover, the safety and security of passengers and airmen continue to be a concern for islands utilizing makeshift airports and unpaved runways without instrument landing systems. However, as we grow and develop each of our, our old island airports one by one with better runways, terminal facilities, and even air tower control, we will ultimately be increasing the safety of aviation in the Bahamas. And with these kinds of futuristic developments, the airspace above the old island airports would be upgraded from class G airspace to possibly class E airspace. This, Mr. Speaker, would be in keeping with the vision of the Bahamas Air Navigational Services Authority Bill, which would allow for the collection of over, overflight fees throughout the entire sovereign territory. As we give the Air Navigation Authority the kinds of airports they need to properly provide service to transiting aircraft in our airspace, we can then make larger and greater steps towards the direction of creating an aviation hub in the Bahamas. Lesson seven, Mr. Speaker. When a plane is coming in for a landing, he will enter the traffic pattern at 1,000 feet mid-downwind. A traffic pattern in the air has an upwind, crosswind, downwind, and base leg into final approach for landing. The tower control can issue any number of instructions to a pilot coming in for a landing. One such instruction can be, November 54360, extend down leg, I'll call your base. November 54360, November 54360, turn base, number two for landing behind the Minister of Tourism and Aviation, Claire Talan. The pilot would then repeat the same instructions, ending what is called saying, November 54360. Mr. Speaker, the aviation industry in the Bahamas has been in a holding pattern for a while. Today, we meet to call its base, to clear these compendium of bills, of aviation bills for safe landing in sequence after the last person I've spoken for today. There's any number of bills and legislations that can be brought to this honorable house that we can play political slingshot and football with. But these bills being of the highest priority to national safety and security are apolitical in nature and deserve this host unanimous support. This morning, we embark on a debate of national interest and concern. Let us rise to the occasion and see these bills for what they are a demand from the Bahamian people to get our aviation industry in order so that we can improve our effective implementation score from 331.98% to possibly, possibly even 91.98%, which would represent the true genius of the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, after a plane has successfully landed, the pilot will contact ground and advise where he or she is on the runway and where they are headed. Nassau ground would then say, November 546, November 54360, make left on Bravo, taxi Foxtrot Sierra to the ramp. Mr. Speaker, it is my honor and my privilege to second and support this compendium of bills for the advancement of aviation in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Welcome to Nassau, I yield, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much, Honorable Member.
Honor honorable members, just two matters as we before we proceed. I'm having difficulty, honorable members, in seeing a number of you. I remember in my early days appearing before the courts, the judge told me that they heard a voice, but they couldn't see me. And then I was advised that I was not properly attired for the occasion. As I, I was not aware in receiving a judgment at the time that I should be fully robed and be. Uh, so honorable members, the chair recognizes charcoal gray or dark gray, navy blue or dark blues, and multiple shades of black. No other colors are acceptable in this chamber. So be guided accordingly. The second matter I have to mention without entering the debate is that I couldn't help but notice in passing two of these bills, these bills, these bills are establishing some statutory bodies and it was indicated earlier this morning that the IKO, the International Civil Aviation Authority, advised that <clears throat> it was improper for the service provider to also be the regulator. And I'm wondering if we recognize that with respect to these statutory bills, why we are having so much difficulty recognizing the constitution of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas that establishes the separation of powers. I'm wondering if the speaker have to contact this, this con have to contact the Commonwealth Parliamentary Association for, for us to recognize this wrong. I don't see why the IKO had to advise us with respect to the establishment of these authorities. I, I can say more on that, but I'll leave that at yeah. that for, for now. We have got to come to the point in these third world black nations that systems produce results. Systems produce results. And if we function in breach of the systems, we will continue to have the type of results that we are having, where we just are simply deepening our dependence on these international bodies and foreign agencies to help us. I believe this pandemic should be a time of purging and change. There's opportunity in every circumstance. And I believe we should, as leaders in this nation, we should seek to do our best to make certain that these systems that we have inherited function according to their design purpose. And we should cease this practice of permitting personalities to supersede the system. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Anglesman. Speaker, I was hoping the member would, for free time would share his speech, but I think he's um, sitting on it. For, I don't know. No problem. <laughs> I, I, listen, I think I listened carefully enough. Um, Honourable respond. member, just, just before Sorry. you proceed, are you <coughs> able to <coughs> lay your speech? The chair recognizes the honourable member for Freetown. <coughs> Speaker, I, uh, 
I am happy to lay my seat. Order that document brought up. My Mr. Parliament. Order that the document do lie on the table. Chair recognizes the honorable member for Angleston. Thank you. May, may I, I, just, I just want to refer to a portion of that at the end there. But thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the people of Angleston. Thank you. I do so because it, it is my privilege of representing that constituency and the people of that constituency for four consecutive terms. When my party suffered widespread defeat and many good people, good people, my respected friends and colleagues lost their seats. The people of Angleston held on to me and have mandated that I stand always on their behalf. It has been an honor all these years to speak for a community which is so deserving of more than I believe I have ever been able to have given, despite putting my best foot forward. And I just want to say, Mr. Speaker, I did not come to this house to play games or to trifle. It's just the nature of how I have grown into my obligations. And the people of Angleston, in my view, deserve more than perhaps I have been able to give, despite my best efforts. They're so deserving of more than the policies of successive governments have ever given. I have argued in this parliament and elsewhere vigorously during the course of my service, both in and out of cabinet, for true and meaningful policies which address, counter, and eradicate the conditions of poverty, where real resources are in invested in communities and a stellar imagination is, ex is executed in creative and innovative and a transformational paradigm changing measures. That's what I yearn for in my representation, to see a state commit to communities that are marginalized and to bring a level of enhanced humanity to people in these communities. And I'm not speaking about token gestures, Mr. Speaker. Like, for example, the so-called Over the Hill Initiative, which is, in my view, primarily a political, I call it ploy initiative. You ain't serious. That's not poverty alleviation. You ain't serious. And that's not what I'm looking for, and that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a focused, comprehensive, and integrated approach, which meets eyeball to eyeball the fundamental inequities and the contradictions which plagues our national life. I have always believed and I've always advocated, and I still to this day believe that governance is not about the continuous empowering of the wealthy, but must be about uplifting the weakest amongst us. And we have seen, we've heard in this parliament, ad advocating trickle down, trickle down to who? To who? You must, you, you must invest in people and make them stronger. You don't trickle down for what, for drips? We've seen in this administration tax breaks for the, for the, for the wealthy and an increased burden on the poor and the average Bahamian. We've seen the special policies, the special privileges for the wealthy by this administration and the burden on the people. Mr. Speaker, I have always wanted to see a true housing policy that addresses not just a housing development scenario, but standards of housing, people who rent, and accessibility to housing. And I went top of the rental assistance program again, because I believe that was a major failing of this administration. They ought to have responded in a timely fashion to people who were facing the crisis of being homeless. They had a story in one of the, 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 the news stations a couple days ago of a young woman and her children sleeping in a car on Montague Beach, and the temperatures had to be in the 50s, and a little two-year-old. Housing is a human right, and why haven't we to date, and I, I got to speak my mind, why haven't we to date brought about policies that says this is a human right, and we are going to focus on it, and we're going to put policies in place that meet 
this need amongst our, amongst our human population. I've not seen it. I've seen some aggressive initiatives in prior administrations. I, I have to say that when Shane Gibson was minister, he was very aggressive. Hubert Ingram, very aggressive. But I have not seen, he was, he was minister of housing. <laughs> the chair recognizes the honorable member for Southern Shores on a point of order. I know it's not the good member's intent to suggest in the specific matter that was mentioned about the lady on Montague, that, that nothing has been done. I've done a little more than find her. We've found her, we've spoken with her, and her response to our offer is that she's not interested in anything temporary. She's looking for a more permanent offer, and she is awaiting an offer that was extended to her. And, and my office has indicated to her, if that doesn't work out, we're still here for you. I understand that. I knew the member for um, Southern Shores always likes to clarify the record, but I could tell you, I have come over case after case of people waiting for rental assistance who have been evicted and who have had to, to be in their vehicles. And I've spoken about it in this parliament, I'm Speaker. <laughs> the clarification, it's easy to generalize. But I say to my colleagues and persons that I meet, each case has its own merits and demerits. When we, when we, when we generalize, we unintentionally mislead because you find that with many of these cases, and I'm not wishing to generalize, but oftentimes some of the reasons why assistance isn't as timely as it ought to be, it's, becomes, it's because some processes have not been followed. But I continue to say, Mr. Speaker, while I am given the privilege to be in this ministry, that any matter that is specifically brought to my attention, I will do my utmost best to cause it to be dealt with on its own merits and demerits and I'm sure my colleagues here would bear me out and testify that matters that would have been brought to my attention to the extent that we were able have been addressed. I don't want to get bogged down in that because that's not the subject matter of the debate. I'm just, I'm speaking generally for the people of Angliston. But I, I want to say that um, I believe the minister announced um, that assistance was coming around December. And the, the pandemic happened around March and people lost their jobs by the hundreds of thousands. And the main people know, I mean, you're saying it's a generalization. I know I've come across multiple cases and the people out there who've experienced it know. So we could, we could craft the narrative as best we can, but there's a, there's a, there is the truth and there are the facts that are out there that people are living every day. And Mr. Mr. Speaker, I have, I, I have always advocated throughout my political career for an aggressive health policy, which promotes good health. All of these things are related to poverty conditions and people are living in. The inability to have decent housing or to access housing. The issue of the healthcare policy, which promotes good health, and it is one that I have spoken about over and over in this parliament, because we have had a positioning where we, fo we, we rather focus almost in, on, on a sing in a single way on treating sickness and managing, managing the terminal, terminally ill, as opposed to promoting good health. We know the statistics tell us that we have high levels of disease globally. We get one of the highest levels for this, the highest levels for that, this little island, this small population per capita. We have very high levels of disease. And now we now are being told our children are being affected and that this is taking a devastating toll on our economy and on our healthcare system because more than half the beds are for people who are suffering from chronic non-communicable diseases. But, but Mr. Speaker, this is, this, this, despite this taking a devastating toll on, on our economy, on the, 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 the well-being of our people, on our healthcare system, we have yet to see this new day, what I call the new day, 
the shining and powerful outcome of a progressive health policy. It ain't that hard. Shift a focus. And, and, uh, uh, no, 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 no. no. The, 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 the chair recognizes the honorable member for sudden short on, this point on a point of order. For the good member to say it ain't that hard in the same breath of saying, I've been here for 20 consecutive years. Ten of those 20 years would have been as a part of the government. That sounds like a self-indictment <laughs> if it ain't that hard. Was, it, was that a point of order, Mr. Speaker? Uh, honorable member. I'm it, only the, asking the, if it the, was. The, the chair yes, will determine. Uh, uh, I find it misleading. If it wasn't misleading in, 20, <coughs> in, in four consecutive terms in 20 years, the good member would have done it and wouldn't been here talking Speaker, about it. The member for Southern Shore has got to stop being the political chairleader in this parliament now. Give up every minute to defend this and defend that. Let me make my presentation. I am saying in my presentation that I have been making this argument from the first day I came in this parliament. So don't get up here and talk about how long I've been here. Speaker? No, no, don't, don't get up in here, Mr. Speaker. I'd be grateful if the member stop interrupting my speech. Because I don't come in here to trifle or to play politics or to play around manipulating the thinking of people so they can elect me next time. Speaker? Speaker, all of these things, a, a, a proper housing policy and a proper health policy, they stimulate, they stimulate economic activity and they improve the na natural, national well-being of our people, Mr. Speaker. Oh, Lord. Uh, uh, Jesus. Are you, are you on a point of order? The member for Angliston is talking about <coughs> progressive health policy. I want to assure the good member for Oh, no. A point of information, Mr. Speaker. I want to show the good member for Angleston that the Ministry of Health <laughs> has a very aggressive policy towards health. Not only do we have a policy that addresses non-communicable diseases, NCDs, in regard to what persons are eating, proper nutrition, working with the Ministry of Agriculture to get more uh, uh, different kinds of food sources into the diet, locally grown foods into the public schools, with the, with the uh, lunch program. But Mr. Speaker, we also have a exercise for, phys for the physical aspect of man, educating and dealing with the whole man, body, mind, and spirit. Mr. Speaker, it's called Caribbean Move, which we are in the process that was deployed last year, was slowed down somewhat because of COVID. And then we also have, we also have, by the way, I did pay the nurses Pine Ridge. For the, for, the, for the record, for the record, for the record, for the record. Uh, 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 honorable Mr. members. Speaker. Uh, 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 Mr. Speaker. Uh, 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 honorable Mr. members. Uh, honorable Mr. member for Bamboo Down. I, 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 get, I get the point. You also have a part uh, uh, of the Ministry of Health. Honorable Mr. members, Mr. you can deal with the mental you can health speak. of our people. Yes, thank, okay. thank you, honorable member. And, and, and Pine, Ridge, uh, Pine Ridge does not know. As usual in this place, he does not know of what he speaks. Honorable member, honorable member for Pine no, Ridge. No, Mr. Speaker, oh. that was the way I was in the Honorable member, are you on? Hon hon honorable member, are, are you on a point of order? Yes, point of order. That the honorable member for Bamboo Town is misleading because the nurses up to lunchtime said they did not receive their payment. And also the leader of the opposition got the same same information. So who's lying? Excuse me. Lies over. Who's misleading? Oh, the, the, the chair recognizes honorable member. Honorable member. Honorable member for Pine Ridge. Honorable member for Pine Ridge. Mr. Speaker. Who are you? Honorable member for Pine Ridge. I'm putting you on notice. Hon Honorable member, resume your seat. Resume your seat. And I'm putting you on notice. If you continue to disrupt the parliament by shouting across the floor of the parliament while you're on your seat and not recognized by the chair, I would ask you to withdraw. The chair recognizes the Honorable member for Bamboo Town. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the member for Pine Ridge is a, is a man of the floor. And I'd remind him of what the good book says, eh? Oh, honorable so, member. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. But let me get to what he said. Mr. Speaker, there are three aspects of persons who work 
in the healthcare sector. There's the doctors, the nurses, and the support staff. There's only one group. All of them, Mr. Speaker, are entitled to overtime to work from Dorian through COVID. There's only one group, Mr. Speaker. The doctors are waiting. The support staff is waiting. There's only one group that was paid, Mr. Speaker, from March to September overtime. You know which group that is? The nurses. The nurses, Mr. Speaker. The nurses who work for PHA, every one of them have been paid their overtime because... On, on honorable member for your... For, for Listen. Uh, honorable Mr. member, this, your clock is stopped. I'm giving him the, 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 the minister the opportunity to, to clear up a matter that was alleged on the floor. Okay. N not you. Mr. Speaker. But the exchange happened. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker. When it comes to the Department of Public, when it comes to, to PHA, all of the nurses that works in PHA have been paid. All of them. There's only one issue, Mr. Speaker, for the nurses in the Department of Public Service. I took a cabinet paper to the cabinet of the Bahamas in September. The cabinet agreed to pay all of the nurses their overtime from March to, to September. It was paid in October. We come into the new year, Mr. Speaker. All of a sudden, there are other timesheets that have come between March and September that we were not aware of, Mr. Speaker, okay? So, Mr. Speaker, we have asked, as a minister, I have gone back and I have insisted, I have insisted because I was told by those in the ministry that all of the nurses, that what we paid in September was for uh, all on, on, of the honorable, honorable member. in the Department of Public Health. Thank so, Mr. You, Speaker, honorable member. Given where we are at now, Mr. Speaker, thank you for the clarification. And those who have now come honorable member for Bamboo Town. Thank you so much for the clarification. Mr. Speaker, those who have honorable now member for Bamboo Town. We will take care of it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, the chair recognizes uh, I, the yes, member. Yes, Mr. Speaker. I mean, you know, Bangu it's really not fair to me that I am not able to complete my presentation. But the minister intervened. He got up to intervene and led to another um, exchange. I don't need the minister to tell me about what program they have. I'm aware of all of that. I'm not, make, I'm not making my comments on any um, lack of considered position. I'm not talking about some side program. I am talking about a singular focus on promoting health. Singular. I'm not talking about what you're talking about. We know about that. We've, I, I've heard about that. I've seen it, done it. I know the exercise thing. I'm talking about all of that. I actually, um, I actually advocate going door to door in communities, educating people to promote good health in this country. I'm, 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 on a different, I'm on a different realm than where you are. What you're talking about? I'm talking about no little project. I'm talking about changing the entire approach. And it is a crisis because we are a very sick population and a lot of people are dying. It's straining our healthcare sector. It's straining our economy. And if we don't see a crisis when we see it, and we can say, well, yes, we're doing this, no problem. But I ain't settling for that. I just want the record to reflect. I do not settle for it. Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> and Mr. Speaker, I have been advocating for years in this house. The Minister of Education is here. We must be able to be honest with the state of education in our country. Oh, my God. What is this? No, 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 Mr. Speaker. No, no. Uh, uh, honorable what? member. The chair recognizes the member for <coughs> Golden Gates on a point of order. Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. State, Speaker. state the point of order, honorable Relevance, member. Mr. Speaker. Relevance. Mr. Speaker, I've, I've listened to the honorable member, and I really hate to interrupt her, but the honorable member, the honorable member has spoken about health. Honorable member has spoken about social services effectiveness and a number of different issues, uh -oh. and now the honorable member is on the education. And Mr. Speaker, I do not appreciate, I, I'm hard pressed to appreciate the relevance to the bills we're debating now, sir. I'm hard pressed to appreciate it, sir. So. On, on members' statement to talk about a committee um, situation who, who's always speaking about this, that, the next thing, and the next thing, and the next thing. So don't don't try that on me now, okay? Do not try do not try that on me, Mr. Speaker. And so, Speaker, we have to be honest with the state of education in our country. We must come to understand that the brilliance of our children is being eclipsed. 
by education policies of successive administrations. And I have said this over and over again. If we think we are doing well in education, we are serving our children, our brilliant children well, then, you know, we are not on the same page. <laughs> Speaker, I have always advocated for a progressive education policy for years in this house, as I, as I view it. And Mr. Speaker, we have gone backwards in our foreign investment policy. I hear the member for Freetown talking about, um, talking about going backwards. He would know about that because the foreign investment policy, when they introduced the Commercial Enterprises Act in this country, which allowed for the fast track or even automatic grant of work permit for industry, some of which you're telling me Bahamians cannot do that, Bahamian entrepreneurs cannot go into those areas. But that's what you did to Bahamian labor in this country. And then we look at even the foreign investment policy in general, and this is, not, this is, this is successive administrations. We give them more and more incentives, but we get less and less benefits for our people. We happy with this? We're happy that we're a tourism destination and the, and the biggest employer is the tourism sector and hotel workers working two and three days in the best of times, four days. <clears throat> we are becoming a place, Mr. Speaker, and not a nation. We are becoming a place and not a nation, Mr. Speaker. Langston Hughes asked in his poem, in his, in, in, his, in his poem, it's called Montage of a Dream Deferred. And he asked this question, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a saw and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode? Speaker, the explosion taking place in our country with the levels of violence amongst, what well, we are amongst the highest in the world in so many categories of violence. It's disheartening to put it mildly. It is distressing. And you know, I don't feel good things. We've got to face reality of what's happening in our country. There's a reality. Just last night, it was a traffic accident, I am told. And out of that accident, someone was killed. We, have, we are a nation of simmering rage. You see it everywhere in this, what, this group and the next group, the next place, the smallest of issues. Does it explode? See, I don't, I don't want anyone to believe I, I just come in here and join some team, you know. I ain't into that, not this stage of my life. Our involvement in politics, my voice, it's not going to tow a line, even, in, and I mean, it ain't towing no line. I have to speak in accordance with my conscience. And I, and I just, and I just, he knows, he knows how I go. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, you see, you, 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 you're minimalizing the seriousness of, of what is happening in the Bahamas. The Bahamas is a serious place right now. A serious place. Now, if you close your eyes, that's your business. But I'm watching, and I'm just watching. Mr. 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 Speaker, I have sought to make this point. But then we see in here already some get defensive and territorial. I don't know why. You don't need a minister. <laughs> Are you the perpetrator? You don't need a minister. But you get defensive and territorial. And, you, what, and, and I would say you don't have the courage to admit the condition of what is happening in our country. Just admit it. We just, have, just, just have the courage to admit it. When a, when a proper diagnosis is made of the patient, then a proper prescription and course of treatment is made. And I declare today, Mr. Speaker, we need a new day in this Bahamas. Today we are speaking about aviation. Must, and, 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 and we must understand, and I think it's the point is being made, that aviation is not some abstract thing for other people, but it is an instrument for building economic strength and enhancing social health, especially for an archipelago. One of the most important initiatives left on the table, but abandoned by this administration, was a policy that was under development for ensuring enhanced connectivity to the southern islands, including Ragged Island and Rumkey. 
That's when aviation touches the ground and does what it needs to do. When the minister came in this house with what he thought was a juicy scandal, and I say to, to self-praise, I, I, I could be wrong, he missed the point when he was talking about the North Andrus Airport. Because the people of North Andrus now have for an airport a terminal, a trailer. They have a, as for a terminal, a trailer. And I thought that he would have been more compelled to, to, be, to be driven by that reality for the people of North Andrus than to come in here and say, oh, you give them so much money for that contract. Speaker, everything is not about politics, but how you advance people in a real way. Yes. And on this issue, you know, I, I heard the member talk about snake oil salesmen. You know, I just want to say that um, a lot of what the member said is not correct, and I'm going to come to that. And I, I would not have gotten into that if he did not seek to come into the parliament to give the impression that those who came before meeting me was some um, incompetent or whatever, whatever the issue is, and that you know it took him to come along. And but I'm going to show that it's fact, it's the opposite, because he's he's now forced my hand because I can't allow when I worked so hard and tried so hard and had such a fantastic team who sacrificed so much. I spoke the other day about how public officers are underpaid, overworked, and that was, and I, I gave aviation as the example. And to come in here and to say that we got worse before he came on the scene is, is, is un, it, it, it is, it, it's not factual, it, it, it's, it's not correct, Speaker. And so, Speaker, I, I just want to give a little background on the aviation by the, the former administration so you'd understand that we were very serious for what we did. The Lyndon Pendling International Airport, which is the gateway to the Bahamas, the largest single investment by any government in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, phases two and three, 400, 409, one, two, and three, $409.5 million. And then we struck the management agreement, uh, which was the, the Vantage Airport Group. It was YVRAS at the time. And I, the members coming in and talk about how he, struck, he changed the deal and the lending is better and all that, but that's nothing to do with this. That was done by a free national movement administration. And we don't need to keep hearing about it because you take responsibility for it. But the, what concerns me about this, and I, I cover the airport because that was a major intervention in the economy of our people and in aviation. But this administration has, we, we struck an agreement with a, with a management company in Canada for 10 years. We knew why we did 10 years, because it was long enough to, I guess, negotiate a term, but in the meantime, to put Bahamians in place and to train Bahamians throughout the nation and then move on, transition. But this member, and he might have been justified in it, warranted in it, he's never given an explanation, Renewed, has advised us, advised us by almost by happenstance that this agreement has been renewed we don't know the terms. It's not being laid in this parliament. And I'm asking the member to lay that agreement in this house. Let us know what you did with the management of LPIA. Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> we, and just, just as a, we also, the runway, we, we, we redeveloped the runway. That was $40 million. We renamed the airport, the Lyndon Pendling International Airport. And at that time, the members of the Free National Movement boycotted it. They didn't go. They said the invitations came too late. And so they were not there, Speaker. On the, the, we, so we redeveloped the airport, the Independent International Airport. And I'm, 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 I'm talking about my, te my tenure because the member has given an impression that I have to now um, re rebut. The, we did solar runway lights on 21 airports because before that people were using trucks to light up for emergency flights and it was dangerous. And the, the member for the member for Freetown inherited that scenario, and there was a, a pilot that uh, allegedly, from what I'm hearing, wanted to, was trying to land elsewhere and couldn't find elsewhere. And the member was asked about the state of repair of the runway lights, and the member said, I don't know, no, I think he said, ask me. And I, you know, I, I certainly I was in opposition. I don't know how, why he would ask me. But just since then, that, that was a wake-up call because that pilot has never been found. They found pieces of the plane and it's caused great grief. And I'm not saying it's, it's anyone's problem, I'm saying, but, but it, it happened. And so it, it, it's something that should raise your consciousness and awareness. Just the other day, the, the lights in Auckland were down again, and, and for the extended period, and I've raised it, I had to raise it more than once. 
I'm told they're now repaired. But um, the, 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 the member, um, I, you know, I want to just show that under his watch, there was a sort of, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get personal with it, but you know, I, I, that's something that ought to have been taken in as a very serious issue. The member came in here and made, made hay of, <clears throat> of downgrading by Fitch rating when, um, you know, it, as fate would have it, it happened under his watch. So he don't talk about it no more. He don't even talk about the 7 million tourists that he inherited no more, speaker. We took over the Grand Bahama airport controllers to ensure that that, op that airport would be operational. And it's been, the point is being raised in here. Um, what, what is the plan for Grand Bahama? What is the plan? No airport, no nothing's gonna happen. We need to know, the, the people of Grand Bahama are entitled to know what is going to happen with that airport. The Exuma Airport, I heard that, the, I, that an announcement made that plans were finished, but we, the, when we did, the plans were finished in 2017. So I don't know what happened. And it was the, the, the accounting, the architectural firm was Alexio and Co. And so I do not know, did you scrap it? And what was the cause of the scrapping? And is it fundamentally different? Why has it taken, when you met completed plans in place, taken you almost four years to look at the Exuma, speaker? <coughs> We put in place a new, new, a new aerodrome in Stanley Key. We redeveloped the San Salvador Airport. Not going to do, did. We redeveloped the May Buona Runway in Bahamas Air landed for the first time in, year, in years. We, we expanded the Bimini International Airport Terminal and lengthened the runway to accommodate larger aircraft and made it ready for night flights. We left in place terminal designs for May Buona, Moors Island, and, and Great Harbor Key. We completed the Marsh Harbor Airport. It was, a, it, was under, it was under construction, substantially completed. And we re renamed it the Lem Leonard M. Thompson International Airport. We did air service agreements with a standard template with 20, 20 plus countries. But the, recently though, <coughs> the minister spoke about one that was struck with the Americans. And I saw a suggestion in there that, that the, the agreement included open skies. And if that is the case, it's the first time that that policy initiative has been brought into place, into play for the air services agreement. And it has implications potentially for domestic carriers. And I, I asked that minister when he's laying the Vantage Airport Group of, uh, Management Agreement of our airport, that he also lay the air service agreement with the Americans to see um, whether he has entered into open skies with the Americans for the first time ever and explained to the parliament why he took, he broke um, what was policy by successive administrations, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> we, we, we put in place the air traffic, um, the, we put in place <clears throat> the air traffic management system in November 2014, an ASR-12 state-of-the-art pulsar radar system commissioned construction of a, a facility housing 3D tower simulators for continuous training and state-of-the-art te technology. We also then, did, and this has really come to modernize the aviation sector. And we brought about after con the same consultants, maybe not the same consultants, but we had respectable consultants advising us in this field, including IKO, the IBB, and all. And out of that came a suite of legislation. And that was the first time, because before that you had the Department of Civil Aviation, everything bundled in there and frankly, close to a mess, I would say, complicated. And we were able, before I left office, to, to bring the legislation and to cause for separation of function. The air navigation um, body was not a part of the Bahamas Civil Aviation. That is not correct what we've heard in this parliament. And it shared a board with the Bahamas Civil Aviation Authority. It was separate, it was standalone, it had its own budget, its own leadership. Now, I do understand that, that and we were advised that it was acceptable. I, I'm now at, uh, understanding and I, uh, that they have now, that the position today or at the time is that they, the preferable um, situation is a stand alone. It's not a problem with that. There's no problem with that. But we don't want to misrepresent what has happened, what, what, what happened here. And you know, even with the, the, the actual investigation, we talked about that before, then the bill came here. <clears throat> So the old civil aviation was gone. The BCAA was created. The ANS, the Air Navigation Division was created. The airport authority took airports. Inve investigation accidents was a standalone. And 
<clears throat> the member um, will note that when he took office, he didn't meet what I met. <laughs> I met a convolution situation. And through the, the good work of fantastic professional Bahamians, we were able to take our aviation sector to a place of modernization. Now, I see the legislation you've brought, and it does some tweaking here and there. It takes out air navigation and bring, uh, creates an authority and matching um, the BCAA and some other things. You take out, allow the director to do the regulation. There's some things that you did there, but this is not what you are purporting it to be. Some groundbreaking scenario. The groundbreaking preceded this. When the, when the divisions were separated, <clears throat> the the um, I want to talk about the the audit because the member has said in this house that we got worse. That from what I've described, he said that may took us that that made us worse. Okay, that when he came, he's making it better. But I just wanted I I, I got the audit, and the member I would say he didn't understand the audit. I wouldn't say he misled the parliament. But if you look at the audit, and I'm going to lay it, Mr. Speaker, the audit of 20, 2017, which was almost six months under this minister's watch. Could you imagine you being there half a year and you still calling on me? You won't give, you won't give me a job, eh? Mr. Speaker, the, um, this, this is the audit. And in this audit, this is the, the legislation is the framework for everything. The, the legislation in this audit puts the performance at 76.19%, not 32%, not 76.19%, fine performing and very few findings. What they did find, however, what they did find was there was a lack of implementation. That's an operational issue. But well, you were there for six months. You, you blame me because you're doing your time operation. This is an ongoing effort. And it started with me. I left. So you got to keep working. Can't sit there and say, well, you, you, you ain't do it last year. And so I got, you know what I mean? You got to keep working. <clears throat> and they're operational. I, you, the, this member knows that they didn't produce the regulations until the 11th hour. And that was a critical failing because they couldn't put in pl place the staff, et cetera. And he knows what the issues are. He knows they have nothing to do with some terrible thing that he inherited. He knows that, in fact, the performance level was very high. I'm going to lay this, Mr. Speaker, 76%. And he knows the regulations came late. And he knows the position they put, it, they put them in. And then I will put this here, current effective implementation. This one has, it had 67.83%, the legislation. That the one that he's saying was just, oh, I just had to come here and change it. So, so um, <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I want to say to the member, and, and only because, and you know, I, I don't relish this, but he, because of the manner in which he sought to cast my service, I got to remind him that he, a um, couple of things, that he, um, he, there's a headline, one of the papers, I'm going to lay it, this is an eyewitness news, I think this is by, um, the reporter is Weston Jones. Where they, the headline is Aviation Safety Recommendations Unaddressed Since 2017. Now, I, I was not there, okay? This is now, this, this story is dated um, September 29, 2020. So this is three years later. But in this, they are making a number of observations of failing by this, administra by this, <laughs> this administration about certain levels of accountability that should have happened. I don't want to go into because my time is running and I was interrupted. And I, I'm, I'm trusting you give me a couple of minutes, Mr. Speaker. But this indicates how findings, including plane crashes, um, where th certain things should have happened and, and they didn't happen, uh, where, there was, where there was not the follow through, the implementation. Implementation. See, you could bring the law all you want. You take the same point. But the implementation is not guaranteed. And this, this news article highlights how the implementation was a, was a factor in um, the non-performance non of um, the standard. It had nothing to do with me. You got to take response. Listen, I, I'm a woman. I got to take my responsibility. And I had plenty blows when I served. Plenty. If I tell you what are the blows I took, but you take your blows, you stand tall, you keep moving forward. That's what you do. 
Speaker. <coughs> Speaker. Speaker, I just want to raise um, just maybe two or three points. The issue of um, the, uh, the Minister of National Security is not here. But before I get to that, the issue of the sovereign airspace. I don't, I'm not quite clear on what the government has done, but I believe they have stepped away from the standard that we had in mind. We didn't just look at the airspace like, oh, let me help do this. Like I say, we collecting some money. That's not what we did. And I spoke this before. We see our airspace as a natural resource. And as a result of that, we, went, we applied to IKO to create our own flight information region that we would have autonomy in our airspace. And of course, we can track with America, it's no problem. But we always anticipated, though, that at some point, Bahamians could rise up professionally, that we would invest, and we would control our own airspace. It sounds to me like this administration has abandoned that course of action. And I just want to say, we had, we had, that's what, that's what it's sounding like, they, they have, they've abandoned it. But, you know, we, we were, when we negotiated the Declaration of Intent, a very important point was made by the Americans and ourselves. And this is what they said. They will support the government of the Bahamas' efforts to establish an extend, extended, expanded flight information region that would be recognized by the International Civil Aviation Organization and by neighboring states. And they agreed to join with us in talking with neighboring states. You had one of the most powerful nations in the world agreeing to this concept. And you have abandoned it because you want to come and tell the Bahamian people you're collecting some money over our airspace. And the, 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 the problem with that, Mr. Speaker, is that they may have set us back. Because to go back now to the table to argue that is going to be extremely difficult, Speaker. Just, uh, I just want to raise two other points, Mr. Speaker. The reservists, uh, the Minister of National Security is not here, but the reservists have not been paid. I'm told that since then, one has died. Yet there's another one who's in the hospital. Please pay the reservists. They came out of their homes. They manned the, 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 um, the shelters. Pay them. Pay them. Pay the people. You know, I had raised before, you know, we should be taking a cut on our salaries in this house. We should be taking a cut, but we don't want to do it. We don't want to sacrifice, but we are, we are telling people you got to wait a year, two years for your money. Something is wrong with that picture. You cannot send a signal that you are uh, entitled to better um, standards or accommodations than your average Bahamians, Mr. Speaker. And the, and the other point I, um, I want to raise is that there were some senior officers that were administratively, um, what, I don't know if you call it administrative, um, they were, they, were, they were put on, they were de deployed on special assignment. <clears throat> Chair recognizes the honorable member for Mount Moriah. I would have spoken <coughs> to this matter on several occasions. For the good member of Angliston to stand up and speak as if she is the authority yeah, yeah. Don't worry. The minute they, Michael dealt with you earlier, QC. Took you to school. You took his bag after it. But for the, no, I'm, I'm gonna, let me say this. Let me say this, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. No, don't worry, Cat Island. You had a lesson in law today, and you called yourself a QC. You had a lesson in the law today. But I, I don't have time for that. Mr. Speaker, I have said it over and over. A cabinet paper was presented to cabinet, all right, during, not too long ago, at the end of last year, in respect to the overtime payment for police reservists. That was approved by cabinet and sent back to the Royal Bahamas Police Force. I would have spoken to the Commissioner of Police recently on several occasions just to follow up. And as far as I am aware, and based on my conversation with the Commissioner, there is nothing outstanding owing to the reserves in respect to overtime. 
as a result of the time spent or worked during Doria. The memo for Anglican intimated on this matter. No, because I, I'm setting the record straight, OK? And her point was, was that it was agreed that the reserves would be paid at the same rate as the career officers. She brought no evidence to that, to that statement to, 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 to prove that what she was saying was correct. So she's being politically informed. I asked the member for Anglister to go back, to return to whomever is feeding her this information and tell them to go and have a word with the commissioner and let him set the record straight. But it's, it's sad that you continue to come to this parliament with no evidence and you, you are acting as if you're the Minister of National Security. <laughs> because you, you, you come here speaking with so much strength, but, 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 but nothing substantive to prove the comments that you're making. Cat Island, thank, thank Cat you, Island, you finish. I got a lot to deal with you with. You will get it in time. You will get it in time. But thank, you had enough schooling today. Thank I understand you. Honorable you again. Uh, uh, honorable member for... <laughs> I don't remember, Frank, said we had, we had another intervention in your time. I was, I was giving you, you the extra three minutes. I, thank you, Mr. So I, I will give you one more minute thank you. To, to wrap up. Mr. Speaker, make that two minutes, Mr. Speaker. <clears throat> but I, I'm, I'm winding down, Mr. Speaker, but I appreciate because I, I had multiple inter interruptions by everyone who's saying that we don't really have a problem in the country. <clears throat> but on the issue of the, of the reservists, um, no, I don't think I'm the Minister of National Security. I am? Oh, okay. Speaker, I, I have been informed by multiple members of the, of, of the force. And what I was recommending to the Minister at the time, because he said this before, is to go back and talk to them. Because the issue, I'll, I'll, I'll elucidate the issue. This is the issue. They are saying... Honorable that, member, if you're using up your time... Yeah, you okay, but they're saying that they... That they okay, I, I'll talk to him privately. There you go. You yeah, and speaker, the speaker, the member, one thing the member will know, I've been here almost 20 I years, and I can tell you, when I say something, listen, okay? Right. Yes, you listen. Speaker, the, I'm glad the minister's here, though. I will raise something for him, another thing I raised him. C calm down, man, calm down. Yeah. Speaker, the other point I want to raise for the member <clears throat> is that some officers, some senior distinguished officers were deployed in what they call some special um, assignment. One of them was ASP Fernando. What was Fernando? Well, he was assistant commissioner. Very high ranking. Peyton Fernando. I'm told that his special deployment has ended and that he's reported to the police, but they, 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 they have him in some sort of limbo. And I just want to say, right? And I'm, I'm not trying to be the minister. Uh, you know, what is it, a point of order? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, honor, honorable members, <laughs> honorable members, I, I extended. I, I started at when your time had expired. <coughs> we are almost seven minutes in now. Um, so I'm. If you keep engaging across the floor, I would have to. I would. I would have to terminate this this time. The chair recognizes the honourable member from Mount Mariah on the point of order. You know, this is unfortunate, you know. <clears throat> you know, we come into this parliament, Mr. Speaker, and we call ourselves honourable people, but yet we make these blanket comments with nothing to substantiate and back it up, right? And, and, then, and then we sit as, uh, we pretend as, as, the, as there's some truth to it, okay? The member continue to make these comments with no, with no factual basis and expect for it to be accepted as truth. You can't come here and say, they, who they? You have a document, you have something to substantiate the points that you were making, and then you're going to go forward and say, I've been in here a long time, it's okay. Many people have been places uh, for a long time and still don't know what they say. Or do it. Take it easy. Go take it easy. Um, if it's not true, we only say it ain't true. You know, don't say you ain't bring no papers to prove it. Just say if an AS, if Assistant Commissioner uh, Honorable Member, Fernanda Honorable Member. has finished his tour of a special assignment uh, and, is in, and is, is in limbo, 
without any Honorable sort of member, proper Mr. assignment. Uh, uh, wrap up, please. You have a I'm, minute to wrap up. I'm wrapping up. And, and if I'm you wrapping. engage, then I will. <coughs> I'm wrapping up. Mr. Speaker, I would rather say that when we have fine Bahamian sons who they put their lives on the line, you treat them with dignity. That's what you do. You don't come here and, and, and jump up and down. You, you treat them with dignity, Speaker. Speaker, I want to end by saying, treat them with dignity. Treat them with dignity. You don't help our country when you don't treat our officers with dignity, Speaker. And Speaker, I want to just end by saying that I um, attended the funeral of Susan Pratt, who was the, um, the head of the um, uh, supplies materials um, supplies agency. And um, I just want to say to the minister that um, I think they missed you there, minister. She was a, one of your top officers and she was very ill. She fought for this country and through a terminal illness. And I, I just want to urge you and maybe, you know, I'll speak with you further privately to reach out to that family so that they have the understanding that the highest levels of the state, the service of that woman in this country is appreciated. Mr. Speaker, I thank you. Right, thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, as many? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Long Island. These are my own people, people whom I am pleased, I have the privilege, the honor of representing in these hallowed halls. Yes. Speaker, I begin by extending my sincere condolences to the family of Ms. Rebecca Knowles. Ms. Knowles lived to the ripe age of 94 and was a gem in the militant community. <coughs> my sympathies to Ms. Nita Smith, Joanne, Darrell, Sandra, and all the children, the grandchildren, the extended family. Mr. Speaker, I also wish to commend the students of Long Island for once again demonstrating excellence with their performances in the national exam. And during a year in education, when, as we know it, it was greatly impacted by the global pandemic, and quite different from the norm. I think I got a call this morning stating that my Grammy, who raised me, was not feeling well. So I just want to say, Mommy, I'm thinking about you, and I hope that you feel better soon. Mr. Speaker, before I begin, I'd like to speak to an observation I made in my constituency this weekend, this past weekend. Come on, Mr. Speaker. The leaders of the opposition acquired a compass and found Long Island for the first time since Columbus came. <laughs> if the member for Cat Island had given me a few hours' notice, Mrs. Speaker, of his visit, I would have sent him a properly clad, fully regaled welcome party. I would have sent him to the airport, and they would have rolled out the reddest carpet, bright blue, to welcome him. Well, Mr. Speaker, we would have even given a souvenir. Red seashells, red shirts, red sun and our glasses. Just so we could commemorate the trip to Long Island. Mr. Speaker, from the pictures, I could tell that the member for Cat Island, Rum Keynes, and Salvador enjoyed the visit to Newton Key and the monument projects that we did this time. And no doubt, based, based on all the photos, I imagine that notes were taken by photo to show how one represents their constituency. <laughs> and so, I'm happy that he appreciated our hard work. And as I see the rollout of the new candidate, I say, come on down, come on down. Mr. Speaker, aviation law is of special interest to me, as this is an area in which I am also specializing in my own practice. 
I've also been pursuing a private pilot's license. And I want to really get into that at some point, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, today we are living in a generation where we are seeing theft run of ultra long haul flights that will directly connect Sydney with destinations across Europe and the United States. Indeed, the aviation sector is not stagnant. And likewise, we must constantly evolve. By all accounts, Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas is out front as a destination of choice for private aviation. This is particularly heightened as people seek to avoid scheduled commercial flights and all those related interactions and restraints during this COVID-19 pandemic. There's an increased interest in this destination, given that we see large groups of pilots known as flying squads that recently flew into Long Island during the winter season. And we can see the impact of private aviation on island economies. This is despite the slow period brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Speaker, over the last year, certainly in my constituency, we have seen an increase in interest as well as actual air traffic to the Bahamas by private aircraft. Given the correlation between tourism and aviation, both industries impact the other. And as such, these effects in the short to near term have been severe. Indeed, last year was a year when we saw aircraft parked on tarmac across the Bahamas. A year when we heard of airlines having to furlough staff or make them redundant. Generally, the local aviation industry during normal times is one of our most vibrant industries. So Mr. Speaker, these bills, that is the Civil Aviation Bill, the Civil Aviation Authority Bill, and the Air Navigation Services Authority Bill, remedy the legal lacunas and existing deficiencies found by the 2017 International Civil Aviation Organization Audit, ICAO. Mr. Speaker, today's bills will address issues in aviation legislation, appease ICAO, modernize local aviation, implement new fees, and give teeth to when there's a breach. It also creates an independent aviation regulatory environment balanced with the government's input and mandate. Mr. Speaker, the passage of these new bills, or with the passage of these new bills, the Bahamas will embark on a new chapter in its aviation history. And so today, today, we mark the beginning of a new era in local aviation, whilst addressing embrace and embrace, embracing standards, security, and recommended best practices as a member of ICAO, and in line with our treaty obligations as a signatory to the Convention on International Civil Aviation, otherwise known as the Chicago Convention. These bills will boost the Bahamas' standing and recognition in the global aviation sector and place the Bahamas in harmony internationally with other nations across the globe. Given the same, these bills will lend to the expansion of legislation governing the sector, repeal largely outdated existing legislation, and make the Bahamas compliant, as I indicated earlier, with our treaty obligations was preparing the Bahamas for the impending follow-up audit by IKO in October of this year. Notably, Mr. Speaker, the Bahamas scored poorly on eight items in the last audit, 2017 audit of the aviation sector. From primary aviation legislation, and this is some of the concerns raised, from primary aviation legislation to specific operating regulation, the system and function, the lack of sufficiently qualified technical personnel, the resolution of safety issues, and so on. Our score after the audit is some 31.98%. These high priority items covered airspace and air navigation services, aviation, regulation, 
in terms of the necessary procedures governing the sector and, of course, aircraft accident investigation. The, the chair re recognizes the Honorable Member Fangerson on a point of order. Give me the opportunity to lay this also because the member just made an assertion and I have it here. Um, on the legislation, the government, the, the country scored at 67.83% and for effective implementation, which is the point I was making also my presentation, 32.17%. So I would, I'd like to lay these, please. Uh, I, I should have laid them earlier. Order, order that the documents be brought. Um, but I'll share a copy with my with my with my um, my brother, my colleague here. Um, the legislation scored high. It was the implementation or the operational aspects that that scored low. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, okay. today's bill. Oh, just a minute. Oh. Um, order that the documents still lie on the table. But you recognize the Honorable Member for Long Island. Mr. Speaker, two minutes round. I just want to make note of that. While we were, while we were seated, sir. Mr. Speaker, today's bill are corrective action plan, which, once passed and executed in conjunction with the appropriate legislation, will revamp the local aviation industry and address safety and oversight deficiencies, inclusive of establishing an independent air accident investigation authority and crack down on hackers. And we know the issues we've had with hackers and crashes in recent years. Mr. Speaker, to take a brief look at the bills, the new civil aviation bill provides for a separate regime for regulation and oversight of the civil aviation industry in the Bahamas. This will govern <coughs> documentation and engagement of all persons in civil, in civil aviation activities. And it also sets out penalties for non-compliance up to 100,000 as opposed to the previous $10,000 penalty, while also setting out avenues of appeal and redress for persons who feel aggrieved by a decision. With respect to the Civil Aviation Authority Bill, the Civil Aviation Authority Bill will provide for the separation clarification and expansion of the authority's functions and powers. The authority will have greater autonomy and will provide for greater or quicker decisions and response time given the dynamism of the aviation sector. As the Speaker, this legislation also introduces a Director General who will be empowered to make operating regulations. And lastly, and perhaps my favorite bill of the three, the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Bill. Of the three, Mr. Speaker, I'm especially biased towards the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Bill. This bill will create an independent air navigation service entity that will be empowered to charge and enforce air navigation service fees to aircraft in and over the territory of the Bahamas. Given that the Bahamas will have more economic control of our sovereign airspace, even imposing penalties and charging late fees for non-payment. Today, we do not benefit at all from overflight fees. Rather, some 75% of our overflight fees are collected by the United States Federal Aviation Administration and 25% by Cuba's Aviation Authority for management of the Bahamas' airspace. This would undoubtedly be a welcome stream of income for our country. The speaker, if there are unpaid, and this is the, 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 the this bill here, if there are unpaid fees, that is service fees, or penalty fees past a particular date, this legislation also allows for statutory liens to be placed on vehicles, that is planes, which will only be lifted if fees are paid in full or via a sale or auction of an aircraft or at the director's discretion or direction in writing. What's more, Mr. Speaker, this proposed legislation or piece of legislation makes way for greater economic diversity and for the development and expansion of an aircraft registry. This would also complement the shipping registry. We have a lot of Bahamian flagship, flagships all around the world. And in turn, we would have a lot of Bahamian flagged aircraft. We have a profitable shipping um, registry 
we can likewise have a very profitable aircraft registry. Given our proximity to the United States and the tourist paradise that we are, we are a perfect location for the registration of aircraft. Particularly, as many high rollers who visit or have homes on the various islands and keys constantly come to the Bahamas with their private aircraft. So Mr. Speaker, at present, we are the only jurisdiction in the Caribbean that doesn't charge overflight fees. So these bills bring us into the modern era, setting up the framework that allows for us to charge. Our sovereign airspace has now been defined and we can collect money from those users and pay management fees to those persons who assist us with managing our airspace on a day-to-day -day basis. This also would greatly speak to our independence. Mr. Speaker, in a 2017 audit, the United States Office of Inspector General stated that the FAA had billed $800 million in overflight fees between 2006 and 2016. That's not for the Bahamas, that's just generally. It builds an estimated 106 million in 2017 alone, but an estimated 126 million in 2019. Undoubtedly, a significant portion of this revenue involves flights that use the Hemian airspace. This is bigger. Annual registration fees, I believe, should also lend to the removal of VAP on aircraft, which would be prohibitive to the Bahamas competing with other states. This would be, this would better our position to successfully compete with the international aircraft registries of places such as Bermuda, the Isle of Man, Cayman, Malta, and so on. A registry coupled with overflight fees will monetize the Bahamas' airspace and will be a major revenue generator for the Bahamas and the management and upgrade of the sector. So I commend the minister and the government for executing an agreement with the Aviation Registration Registry Group out of Miami to assist in the launch of the country's new aircraft registry. Mr. Speaker, this compendium of bills lends to the creation of a competitive first-class civil aviation sector in the Bahamas. And above all, Mr. Speaker, it helps the Bahamas to establish a more vibrant, self-sustaining aviation sector that is funded by user fees. The potential of the sector is vast. And to reference the commentary of a former colleague of mine, attorney Llewellyn Boyer Cartwright, this potential includes registration, maintenance, leasing and insurance, financing and attracting those who register private aircraft here. Mr. Speaker, I want to turn my attention from the bill, which I fully support, to Long Island. You know, I cannot get in this place and not speak about Long Island. Mr. Speaker, I couldn't speak here about civil aviation today without speaking to the needs of my people. We remain in desperate need of a world-class international airport. Over the years, whilst other islands got airport and or may have seen improvements two or three times to their airport, we've not had any improvements to the airport in Deadman Key since it was built in the 1950s. Mr. Speaker, I was pleased to speak to the most honorable member for Kalani this weekend and told of his fervent interest in seeing the start and completion of the new Long Island International Airport. I was ecstatic to hear of his trust and that of the government to acquire funding, which I believe he indicated we might now have to develop, and the, and the minister has confirmed that just now, to develop the Long Island International Airport. And so I thank the Prime Minister for keeping his commitment, our commitment, to the people of Long Island. Mr. Speaker, I want to also thank the Honourable Member for Freetown and Director Alton Cargill, both of whom remind me of local motives. They push and they push like the engine that could. 
And so I welcome the news today of Long Island, Long Island having its $18 million airport started by the end of the second quarter A ground being broken in Long Island. I welcome that. All of my life, I have heard of the need for an airport. All of my life. And so, Mr. Speaker, with a survey having now been completed, architectural and engineering drawings or renderings being completed, and an environmental impact assessment on the way, we're making steady progress. And the news of the groundbreaking is great news today. So I'm cognizant of the urgency and the anxiety for all of us as Long Islanders to see shovels in the ground, to see this groundbreaking. Mr. Speaker, this airport will represent the long-awaited attainment of a dream many Long Islanders have yearned to see, and many have gone on and never seen it. Mr. Speaker, with the impact of Hurricane Joaquin 2015, decades of neglect and COVID-19, all of them together, it will undoubtedly take government's intervention to prime the economic pump in Long Island. And the airport presents the best prospect for that to happen. So for many years, I've said this many times, Long Island has been the sleeping giant of the Southern Bahamas, even though they say we are in the central Bahamas. We've been lagging behind our sister island in a state of near hibernation as the island passed us by and our economy and infrastructure deteriorated year over year. For many years, we have felt as though we were the forgotten outsider in the island chain. Before the FNM electrified the island in the early 90s, like most Long Islanders, we used lamps and lanterns and a gas generator. I vividly remember that. I vividly recall the sand flies and mosquitoes being chased away with makeshift fires that propelled or that produced a repellent smoke. And I remember my folks using a goose iron with charcoal before electricity was extended. We had no electricity. Or when the gas generator was off, no fuel, the goose iron. Iron, this is good. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, that shows you, not Abaco, that Long Island is just finding its footing after many, many years of neglect. Many, many years of neglect. Mr. Speaker, whilst the fate of Long Island has somewhat turned around since our election in 2017, we continue to have a ways to go, sir. Relative to our economy, Long Island's economy continues to await the boom that our sister island, Exuma, or islands, Exuma, Elutra, and Abaco, have experienced. Even today, fishing, a few government jobs, a handful of small farms, and tourism, the hotels, the bigger hotels primarily in the northern end, are the main lifelines for Long Island. And Long Island does. Since the turn of the millennium, there's been no major investment or development in Long Island. That is private, major private development on the scale of some of these other islands. And so for many, many decades, we've just scrapped, scrapped with the hope that we would get further government intervention to turn our fate around. And I believe, Mr. Speaker, that sustained the government intervention and infrastructure will in turn spur private investment. Mr. Speaker, notwithstanding the appreciable contribution that is financially, intellectually, and culturally by Long Islanders to the growth and overall success of the Bahamas, due to the state of our airport, Long Island remains barely accessible. So as I stated earlier, earlier, we are in desperate need of an international airport. All of my life, all 36 years, free town, all 36 years, free town, I have heard <laughs> about this airport. And so to deliver this would be a monumental Olympian, Olympic-like 
feat. This will be a feat. Unprecedented. Unprecedented breakdown. And so, Mr. Speaker, quite honestly, sir, anyone who's come to Long Island or been to Long Island recently, or one of my colleagues in here, landed there at the Deadman's Key Airport, would know that the current terminal is jammed up, comparable to a, a chicken coop. Or, as we say on the islands, a, a cubby hole. Not Andrews, I know you know about cubby holes. Not, not Andrews and not Abago. If it rains at the airport, all of the members of Parliament, that's all 39 of us, will be unable to fit in the terminal. And as it stands, most of us already stay in our cars or under makeshift cabanas or simply get soaked. There's no designated parking for the staff of the airline that operate from there. In fact, I recently landed at Deadman Key, and I can feel the poor state of the runway surface and visibly observe the small expanding potholes. So, Mr. Speaker, as I said, the lack of airlift is killing Long Island. This has held Long Island back. And so, Freetown, the development of Long Island International Airport, an airport constructed in the 70s, I mean in the 50s, an airport constructed 70 years ago. This is monumental for us. And so, I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. And, and we look forward to these improvements in Long Island. Mr. Speaker, we believe that this new international hub represents the turnaround that the economy needs, would lead to construction, spin-off businesses from tour companies to restaurants to bars to straw and craft vendors, fishing, rental cars, etc. Which address the issue of brain drain. Many people leaving Long Island as soon as they graduate, more people would stay home. And broaden employment opportunities, encouraging more Bahamians and foreign investors also to come to Long Island and invest. And so this is the catalyst for Long Island growth. When I talk to businessmen like Gus Cartwright and Ellis Major, they tell me that they want to invest more, but their investment of millions is contingent upon the expansion of this airport. The same thing for some of the more established resorts on the island. Okay, and so Mr. Speaker, this is my view, my considered view, and this airport would lend to further diversifying Long Island's economy and support growth in other areas from agriculture, fisheries, entrepreneurship, and manufacturing. So I just want to again say how overjoyed I am to hear the ground will be broken in the second quarter for this new first class airport. And we can say we have delivered water, delivered airport, delivered road, delivered bus shelters, but I, I, I can't even name all the things we've delivered. But we have delivered. We have delivered. We have delivered. And rest assured that we have a list. That we have a list. And anyone coming to Long Island will have to speak to that list. Our record will speak for itself. Our record will speak for itself. That's right. No matter how young they are, our record will speak for itself. And so, Mr. Speaker, I also want to say to my good friend from Freetown that Long Island is both on island and in the diaspora. Have expressed to me, man, listen, we are prepared to put skin in the game too. So if the government hadn't gotten that money, they're like, listen, let's set up a vehicle like APD. And let's do this. And guess what? If they are able to buy shares in their own airport, us, Long Islanders, we would welcome it. Okay, after if the airport is constructed and the government decides to sell shares in the way that the, our port authority or, or our port did, port development. Mr. Speaker, as I conclude, 
I know that Long Island, a major island, is essentially on bank with the pullout of Scotia Bank. And given that, I am requesting that the Bank of the Bahamas give consideration for coming to provide those services to this island. An island that is a major island with a sizable population and a well-heeled well healed business people and various government agencies and ministries. Notably, Long Island is big in size, population, and economic output. There are several islands where I see the BOB is currently situated. So I am fervently calling for the Bank of the Bahamas to come to Long Island. Mr. Speaker, I support these bills. I thank you, sir. Thank, thank you, Honorable Member. Many. Chair recognizes the member for Central and Bahama. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy. As my father would say when he get up to speak, I stand here today on the strength of mine, but on the strength of the Almighty God. Mr. Deputy, it is indeed my pleasure to address and convey my support in these hollowed and sacred chambers on the compendium of bill as presented by the minister. Moreover, I note with emphasis that presenting these remarks on behalf of the beautiful people of Central Grand Bahama is indeed a privilege. And while I'm on Central Grand Bahama, let me, Mr. Deputy, please indulge me a few minutes to say thank you to the Almighty God for allowing us in Central Grand Bahama to reap our first harvest of crop on Monday, February 1st, um, just two days ago. Mr. Deputy, I heard Angerson um, spoke earlier about proper nutrition and being, being careful with our dieting and um, watching our, our health, health issues in this country. And I'm happy that Central Grand Bahama is doing something about it. On Monday, we invited three organizations to, to accept our first fruits. And one of the organizations, and a member of Southern Shore is not here, was the children's home of Grand Bahama. Um, of course, it's very important to, you know, properly feed our children and teach them that the, the Bahamas has the capacity to produce food in sufficient quantities, and that we have to encourage them to get into farming. There's no, there's no shame in being farmers because food security right now is extremely important. Uh, the, the second organization, the member for Bamboo Town, you'll be pleased to know that we invited the Food and Nutrition Department from the Rand Memorial Hospital. And they came over and they also accepted a package on behalf of their clients. And, and finally, we invited a nursing home in Central Grand Bahama, home away from home. So we catered to the children, we catered to those in hospital, and we catered to those in nursing home. And it was important for us to give these packages and included in the packages were kale. And you know, kale is extremely nutritious, helps with antioxidant, good source of vitamin C, helps with lower cholesterol, vitamin K, helps with blood clotting, et cetera. Beets, super fruit. Um, again, we offered beets, fights infl inflammation, good for digestion, anti-cancer qualities, et cetera. And finally, cabbages. Again, anti-inflammatory, qualities, vitamin C, help with digestion and lowers blood cholesterol. Now, Mr. Deputy, let me say this. Those cabbages were so big and heavy. I, I, I thought about bringing some colleagues to, to, to Parliament, but I'm telling you, they were so heavy, I believe the airline will charge me overflight fees, overweight fees. So, <laughs> So, so I think uh, uh, whenever you're in Grand Bahama, 
you have to come and collect on your own behalf and you pay your own overage fees because I'm <laughs> telling you, when you look at the pictures, you will see those were extremely large. Um, but again, I want to thank all of the partners who volunteers at Central Grand Bahama Farm, um, as well as the Minister of Agriculture, who've been very supportive here in this team. Uh, Mr. Speak, Mrs. Deputy, the International Civil Aviation Organization, also known as the Chicago Convention, is a specialized arm of the United Nations whose mandate is to ensure the effective, safe, and coherent international civil aviation evolution. The IKO was first established, as we said earlier, by the member for Bain Town in Chicago in December 1944. This convention establishes rules of airspace, airplane registration, and safety, and details the signatory's right concerning air travel. Civil aviation is a powerful force and pertinent sector for progress in a highly connected and modernized society. It creates and supports millions of jobs worldwide and hundreds right here in our Bahamas. Mr. Deputy, in our country, tourism is indeed the lifeblood, or as some will say, the bread and butter of our economy. Civil aviation is a catalyst for travel and tourism, the world's largest industry. Beyond economics and financial interests, air tra transport enhances society's social and cultural fabric and facilitate attaining peace and prosperity across the globe. Most notably in the Bahamas, air transport is critical to the emergency and humanitarian response cap capabilities during disasters such as hurricanes and public health emergencies. Therefore, Providing efficient global and local regulations and policies for such activities is essential in ensuring quality, stability, and effectiveness at all levels. Mr. Speaker, in 1975, the Bahamas adopted and ratified the Chicago Convention with hopes of forging a safer future in the realm of civil aviation. Since then, four key legislations were passed to mirror the country's commitment to these international standards. They include the Civil Aviation Licensing of Air Service Regulations in 1976, the Civil Aviation Act 2016, the Civil Aviation General Regulation 2017, and the Civil Aviation Civil Penalties Regulation. Despite these efforts in 2017, the International Civil Aviation Organization recommended attention to airspace and air navigational services aviation regulations, making procedures, and aircraft accidents investigations. This call resulted in the development of corrective action plans, expert guidance, and vast stakeholder engagement to modernize and enhance civil aviation legislation in the Bahamas. In this view, Mr. Deputy, the government of the Bahamas seeks to present the Civil Aviation Bill 2021 the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas Bill 2021 and Bahamas Air Navigational Services Authority Bill 2021 to further protect, I say that to further protect and enhance the safety of everyone involved in the activities of the aviation industry. These bills recognize the need for procedures and seek to provide a framework that will allow efficient structure and reciprocity. Under the aviation sector, regulations are wrapped into forms of certification, personnel licensing, airworthiness of aircraft, aircraft accident and incident investigation, and safety management. These regulations are essential to ensuring safety and economic efficiency. Mr. Deputy, the introduction of the Civil Aviation Authority Bill 2021 will provide the furtherance of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas as the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas. Separate, clarify, and extend the authority's functions and powers. Serve to separate the administrative and regulatory functions of the authority from the other provisions regulating the civil aviation industry. In summary, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy, the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas is the institution where technical support will emerge to fulfill requirements specified in the Civil Aviation Bill. 
Mr. Deputy, the introduction of the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Bill will separate the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Division from its regulator by creating an independent air navigation service entity with prescribed responsibility. Mr. Deputy, the United States Government Accountability Office explained that as, that as of March 2005, 38 nations worldwide had commercialized their air navigation services, fundamentally shifting the operational and financial responsibility for providing these services from the national government to an independent commercial authority. Mr. Deputy, it is expected that this initiative will lead to further transformation and evolution of the industry in the Bahamas. Moreover, the Bahamas Air Navigation Service Authority Bill provides powers and functions of the new authority, empower the new authority to enforce air navigation service fees for aircraft in and over the territory of the Bahamas and requires accountability and cooperation between the new authority and the CAAB and compliance with it operating regulation. Mr. Deputy, it is abundantly clear that revolution, efficiency, and structure remain a clearly defined commitment of this minister-led government in every socioeconomic sector. Mr. Deputy, I note that the introduction of the Civil Aviation Bill 2021 is the principal document that will give rise to various entities and invariably an effective aviation industry. See, this bill seeks to provide a separate act for regulation and oversight of a civil aviation industry in the Bahamas. Inform persons or entities requiring aviation documents to engage in civil aviation activities. It outlines the process for application of necessary documents and summarize the penalties for non-compliance. Very important. It provides a guide on how to find redress for any decision taken against them concerning aviation documents and stipulate operating regulations for domestic and international aviation op operations. Mr. Deputy, in 2019, in its safety, the foundation of everything we do, the Federal Aviation Administration ascertained that the most significant reason behind embracing any rules and regulation is for personal safety and safety of customers and co-workers. This has been confined as essential in a sector like the aviation sector where aircrafts with passengers are always at the mercy of aviation personnel. So important. Neglecting the safety rules and regulation in this sector could result in incidents or accidents with serious injuries, loss of lives and properties and attracts severe recourse and actions by the state. Mr. Deputy, these bills laid before us today seek to ensure that safety remains a paramount concern as the Bahamas etched its mark on the global scene. Mr. Deputy, in advance of closing, I reference an incident for which my service as an architect and project manager was required to address a security issue at LPIA following 911, 9-11 incident. And yes, I was intimately involved um, as architect and project during the phase one transformation of the Finland Airport. The time frame given to complete the assignment required my team to work almost 24 seven. Notwithstanding challenges, I must, I must commend the honorable member from Angleston who served in the capacity as minister with responsibility for aviation for invaluable support in endorsing a capital plan for which I had oversight to address in record time, security challenge at the airport. You know, 911 really changed the world. And at that time, ICAO insisted, insisted that by January 1, I stand to be corrected, Angston, by January 1st, had we not upgraded our security system at the airport, changed the conveyor system, installed the, the x-ray machinery, had a proper baggage fill system in place, the Bahamas was gonna be decertified. Completely no planes would leave or land in this country from any IKO country. 
I lived that. There were many sleepless nights. And I can tell you, Angliston called me on a regular basis. Um, you are the right man for the job. And that was, that was the slang used by that party at the time. <laughs> so I said, he said, um, uh, Mr. Lewis, are we going to be finished in time? I said, Minister, we have no choice. If you don't get this project finished, the Bahamas will be deserted. And like I said, she really supported me on the team. I remember Mr. 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 Robert Valley Roberts was the, was the Minister of Works at the time. And, and no, it was a team. It was Bahamians working for the betterment of the Bahamas. And, and, and of course, it was a great experience. And of course, come, come January 1st, 2006, when IKO inspectors came, the Bahamas passed in fine colors. We, we, we got fully certified. And of course, the airspace um, remained in effect. Mr. Speaker, like I said, the, the assignment was finished in time. And of course, the rest is history. One thing that Angus said to me after the job was finished, and, and I, I, I must speak with Mr. Joseph Reckley. I'm an Abacoonian, I'm not Abaco, I'm Green Turtle Key. Very good man, very supportive. He, along with Idris Reed, he said, Against our Lord, young man, we never knew that we, we hired you and almost thought we set you up because we didn't thought it was possible for this job to be completed. Uh, I thank you, Angus. And I can tell you, Mr. Reckley, Joseph Reckley, Idris Reed, I think Wellington uh, Neely was the engineer. Peter Tynes was one of the project managers. We had a good team. And against our Lord, we were able to get that job done. And she said to me, um, anything that comes up in this country with your name to it, I'm going to support it. I say, I thank you very much. But there are other talented Bahamians around. All they need is a chance. You give them a chance, and they can show you that Bahamians can produce. So again, that was an example of give, being given an opportunity and Bahamians working together for the betterment of our country. Mr. Speaker, the history of our aviation industry has been laced with very few adverse incidents. Nonetheless, those that have occurred remind us of the need for ongoing reform and represent lumps along a dark road that our people have trotted together. Today, we are here to eliminate any future adversities in the aviation sector via legislation and comprehensive and holistic policies. Mr. Speaker, the transformation of the regulatory reg regime for the aviation industry has placed the Bahamas in a position to best meet its obligations to adhere to the principles and best practices set by the Chicago Convention in 1944. With the passage of these bills, the Bahamas will be better poised and readiness for the post-COVID-19 recovery and for the upcoming I IKO audit. And I must also thank the current minister for the energy and the tenacity. He insists that we get us done. So, so again, the same energy that I experienced with Angus I'm experiencing that same energy with the new minister. They want to get it done for the Bahamas. And Mr. Deputy, I reiterate, the Central Grand Bahama supports bill laid before us, the bills laid before us and look forward to continuing to conduct the Bahamian people's business in these hallowed and sacred chambers. Mr. Deputy Central Grand Bahama, thank you. Right. Thank you very much, member for Central Grand Bahama. As many. The chair now recognizes the member for Centerville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. My theme for this presentation today is against the odds. We are still a country worth fighting for. Mr. Speaker, this message is a part of a message that will be reiterated throughout the dangling of the carrot season. And this is dangling of the carrot season part four. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker and members of the House of Assembly. Good afternoon to Centerville. And good afternoon to the entire Bahamas. Let me begin first by telling members of the House of Assembly and of course the Centerville constituency how much I love and appreciate them and how notwithstanding our differences, I wish them and every Bahamian the very best as we transition into a new and a compliant government. Lord, when you had the people of Centerville remove the former prime minister, you were on to something. I am not worthy enough, however, to even know why you chose me to do that, but you did. I am not worthy, Lord, for you to come even under my roof. But if you speak the word only, my soul shall be healed. Mr. Speaker, a lot of ratifying or so-called ratifying was going on lately. And so I take, take this opportunity to thank the people of Centerville for ratifying me. <laughs> they gave me more than 400 signatures in support of me. Mr. Speaker, that's a people's ratification, not a party ratification. So I encourage all aspiring politicians to get properly ratified. Ratified by the people, not by a party. Ratified by the people, notwithstanding a party. Let me thank the Minister of National Security on his speedy press release last week on the appointment of an acting parliamentary commissioner, which was said to have been done since the 23rd of December, 2020. This press release I noticed came after the people of Centerville through me raised the issue last week of a lack of substantive parliamentary commissioner, especially after the passing of an historic parliamentary elections legislation making way for a permanent register. Mr. Minister and Mr. Prime Minister, acting, acting, really? Are we aware of the democratic weight of that position? Mr. Speaker, model of dictatorship that I speak of often in disguise, it just can't seem to escape us. With all due respect to the acting parliamentary commissioner, acting, that is why the appointment is made by the governor general. It is the highest office of our democracy, in my opinion, and it is to me under the threat of non-compliance and non-democratic principles. Did the governor general, Mr. Deputy, appoint an acting Parliamentary Commissioner? Well, I guess I will wait for Democracy Day, the second Wednesday of the month, which is February 10th, next week, to see if we have answers to questions. Um, Senator, before you continue, let me just caution you. I, the rules speak specifically to um, how we address and speak to institutions, um, Senate, the Senate, the Honorable Senate, the Honorable House, and I'm sure it also speaks also to uh, Honorable Gov well, the Governor, His Excellency or Her Excellency, whoever happens to be the Governor General. So I'm just cautioning you. I, I see you treading um, close to the, very close to the ocean there. So just okay. be careful that now you. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy. I will not belabor this particular issue of the CSJP, which is the Citizens and Security Justice Program, which the Minister of National Security, sir, is also responsible. I am sure that the people are aware, and so is the government, of the seriousness of managed funding as it pertains to our at-risk youth, the violence in our community, and the criminal element and the impact of it on our judicial system. 
We just had another shooting, Mr. Deputy, in DeVoe Street. And my prayers go out to the DeVoe and Milton Street community, which is a part of the Centerville constituency. May I, through you, Mr. Deputy, to the Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, request a report on the funding allocation of the Citizen and Security Justice Program, headed by the Minister of National Security. <clears throat> Today, Mr. Speaker, though, we are here to debate the Civil Aviation Bill 2021, the Civil Aviation Authority Bill 2021, and the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Bill 2021. Mr. Speaker, whenever I'm debating or a debate comes up, the first thing I look for is the impact of every single piece of legislation on the lives and well-being of the Bahamian people. I will speak to these bills in its compendium. However, the theme and the message remains the same. Mr. Speaker, a compliant government and a compliant nation leads to the vision and development necessary to defend against all odds, even a pandemic or even a category five storm, but we must be able to comply. The minister quoted, and I concur in his remarks, that it must be a system of uncompromising compliance when it comes to aviation and air safety. Let me congratulate the Progressive Liberal Party on the role the administration would have played in introducing these laws. And also I would congratulate the Free National Movement on their subsequent efforts, a necessary role they played in ensuring it got to Parliament. Centerville understands the importance of these laws for the improvement of civil aviation and air transportation services. Centerville also understands their importance to air safety and the need to preserve and protect our air spaces. We do see the need, however, to reflect on air aviation revenue and the importance of ICAO, ICAO compliance to the establishment of the aircraft registry. There was a question, Mr. Speaker, of whether airspace is a natural resource. And like Angliston would have indicated earlier, that was the definition, that was what they took from the, their work during the, um, their course of action with regards to sovereignty of our airspace. And this is one of the reasons why, Mr. Speaker, Centerville continues to push for a legislative definition, a consistent le legislative definition of natural resources so that there not be any confusion as to what should go into the Sovereign Wealth Fund on behalf of the Bahamian people. We like that these bills represent international standards and that the improvement in the quality and safety of our air service, along with a way to facilitate revenue collection in the aviation industry, should be priority. The minister, though, in these uh, bills, have too much has too much power. And the bills seem only to reflect the powers of the minister and the director general. You have created authorities with all appointments made by you, the minister, too political and too polarizing for the progress that these bills intend to have. The minister, Mr. Speaker, referred to the latest rating and indicated the need for legislative and operational compliance as it relates to enforcement. The minister said there was not effective implementation of the law. Well, right back to Centerville's issue. It's an issue of compliance, the parliament and the need to comply even with our own legislation. Your quote, Mr. Minister, about uncompromised compliance is in fact important. It leads to discipline and hence the resilience of our people. I would have liked to see more legal recourse for Bahamian families whose lives were lost as a result of aviation 
um, disasters or tragedies. It seems so, Mr. Speaker, as if these reports are far reaching and the philosophy of out of sight, out of mind becomes the order of the day. Mr. Speaker, many families are left with no answers, no closure at times, no accountability, no transparency. These bills, Mr. Speaker, with austere quality assurance programs as signed on with the Chicago Convention and ICAO, yet no regulations attached and limited level of accountability to the parliament. No compliance officer, no education officer or training officers to speak to career paths in the aviation and aircraft industry and more so, Mr. Speaker, career paths as a spin-off from the aircraft registry. These bills, Mr. Speaker, in my opinion, have minimal reporting functions to the House of Assembly. Where is the career path in this for Bahamians? Do we have an aviation department at DTVI? Could that be a spin-off from the lucrative aircraft registry, registry business that you speak of? Last time I checked, we had no aviation curriculum, but could this be a national policy? Mr. Speaker, time and time again, I have asked for bills to be accompanied by regulations, especially in the more technical areas where compliance and enforcement sometimes is difficult to be aligned. Aviation, Mr. Deputy, is a very technical field. And if we are going to use it as a part of our national economic development plan, the minister should make regulations and in fact table administrative policies and guidelines as it relates to air safety and air the aircraft industry. With regulations and policy guidelines, we get a more educated society and a more compliant society. We get a more accountable and a more transparent government. The bills, Mr. Speaker, speak to the authority's responsibility to the Chicago Convention to ensure its principles and arrangements are adhered to and obligations of safety and security are met. What I have noticed, Mr. Speaker, with many pieces of legislation brought to this parliament over the years is that they are vague when it comes down to compliance. And therefore, there is obviously will be a lack of enforcement. This must change. Minister, you spoke today about uncompromising compliance and did not mention our leaders in the compliance profession. Centerville makes a clarion call today on the president of the Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers to make your association a part of the national conversation. You have an important role to play in our national development. Madam President of BACO, Maria Dorset, and Vice Andrew Delavo. We encourage you to expand your compliance reach to aviation and the maritime industry, as well as to the government. I was very proud to see the founder of the Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers, Mrs. Cheryl, Cheryl Bazard, speaking out on the issue of the, this administration and their non-compliance with their own orders. BACO must let their compliance voices be heard. I am very proud, Mr. Speaker, of Belinda Wilson. Like her or not, this country is indebted to her because of her voice. She has fought tooth and nail for the educational development of our children over the many years, lending a voice and direction to our educational system, a system desperately crying out for attention and direction for our precious children. So BACO, the Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers, we need you to be a part of the development of our nation. We need you at the table. You ought to speak to national compliance as an issue for economic recovery and national development, not just in financial services, 
but compliance in general. It was said because of the compliance to the protocol, the Bahamians, the Bahamas did well. Compliance, Mr. Deputy. Baco, the non-compliance of the house rules should be an issue for you. The non-compliance and non-responsiveness to petitions of the people should be an issue for you. The non-compliance of ministries of government should be an issue for you. You are the Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers, and you play a huge role in our economic recovery and in the development of our nation. We cannot leave everything up to parties and career politicians. That's what got us in this mess in the first place. Now that comment, Mr. Speaker, was not to overlook the good that was done by some administrations, but to emphasize the seriousness of where we find ourselves at this time. Mr. Speaker, these enacted authorities today need a compliance officer. The House of Assembly needs a compliance officer, for that matter. I believe civil aviation is one of those areas that needs a qualified compliance officer to ensure operational, regulatory, and legislative compliance. Broaden the base minister as you inadvertently create and build even a new industry within an industry. But you have to be open. You have to be open to the knowledge and the talents of our people and open to the principles of managed democracy and collective responsibility. The issue, however, with these bills is that we haven't taken it far enough by legislating our independent compliance officers within this legislation, who somehow and could unusually reports directly to your already politically polarized board. We must diversify our talent and our existing industries, have more inclusive laws in order to enrich more of our people. There are too many monopolies as we monopolize the minds of our people in order to have some sort of control or even to win elections. The first thing the Bahamian people will do after the next election is to appoint a compliance officer in each ministry to ensure that not only that policies and procedures are being followed, but that the government lives up to its commitments, its commitment to pensioners, its commitments to these unions, and its commitment generally to the Bahamian people. Bahamas, there will be no economic recovery without equality. It's just not going to work. We all have to be equal in order to ensure that economic recovery happens. And there will be no economic recovery without compliance. Uncompromising compliance. In the words of Ikeo, compliance with our laws and rules will unleash the economic and educational power of our people. Just comply. Comply with our own rules and laws, starting in here. We keep rehashing and renaming laws. Just comply for the advancement of our nation. Non-compliance with laws by the lawmakers, Mr. Speaker, is evidence of dictatorship. Satterville, Mr. Speaker, was not happy with the sections of these bills that spoke to the presentation of audited financial statements. Very vague, very unclear. The law said that audited financial statements are to be laid by the minister at each house of assembly. 
that means that audited financial statements only need to be laid once because it's only one House of Assembly at a time in five years. I think we need to speak specifically to annual reporting, not general reporting, not with this. Not with our three authorities, we're talking about aircraft safety and aircraft registry. We're talking about economic value and usage. I think we need to revisit the reporting of those uh, financial statements. I also note in that very same paragraph that audited financial statements ought to be laid, but the audited financial statements don't have to be independent because it doesn't mention the word independent or external, which means we can have the same old system of maybe, maybe not presenting statements and where, just where are these statements being audited. I think the people should get more clarity on the reporting function of these authorities. Mr. Speaker, Speaking to, uh, because this is an issue that um, I do have a question on, but the point that the member is making I don't think is accurate. Um, he's saying that there is no de definition as to uh, what is to be reported and when. But if you look at, for instance, in the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Bill, and it's repeated in the uh, Civil Aviation Authority Bill, uh, section 17, number five, it says three months after the end of each financial year, the authority shall submit a copy of the audited accounts to the minister, together with a copy of the report made by the auditor. Okay. So I'm not exactly sure what it is that you're referring to, or... Let me just... Which page? Which one? Which page? This is the, the Bahamas Air Navigation, uh, section 17, 17, number 17, number five. Section 17, sub five. 17.5. 17.5 in the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority. Three months after the end of each financial year, the authority shall submit a copy of the audited accounts to the minister, together with a copy of any report made by the auditor. I think that's what the member is referring to. Okay, well, just for I think he said that is also mirrored in another bill. Yeah, um, just for clarification purposes, I think... Um, it does say that these audit accounts, audited accounts to the minister, there's no reference to the House of Parliament. So the minister then can keep the audited accounts with him, is basically what you're saying here. And so yes, three months after the end of each year, the authority shall submit a copy of audited accounts to the minister. I am speaking specifically to your reporting function to the House of, Sem of Assembly and the Bahamian people. And that is very clear when you go. I'm trying to recognize the member for East Grand Bahama. And I, I am defending the point, very point that I was going to raise. <laughs> Still on the. But I'm going to raise the point for you in a different way. But uh, the, the minister, it, it, it's point seven. In the which, same, uh, which, which bill, sorry? Uh, this is the same Bahamas Air Navigation Services bill, item number 17. In the same uh, um, section, uh, number seven, the minister shall lay a copy of such audit accounts. Which, which accounts are we talking about? The audited accounts that he would have received on the authority before each House of Parliament. I can accept your word each should say uh, annually, but each a copy of such audit accounts naturally means if he gets a copy of the audit report, you must lay it. That's not natural. Uh, well, I, in my interpretation, together with a copy of any reports made by the auditor or, or on the accounts. So the auditor lays or, or presents a report to the minister the minister has an obligation to lay. 
I know. Well, I think the question that you may want to ask, uh, and, and my humble suggestion, the point that I was going to raise, is that there is no time period in which the minister has to lay. So you might want to suggest uh, an amendment to say that the minister must lay these accounts within X period. That makes sense. And, but, but I'll get into the, into the debate also, um, member. I, I think uh, the point raised by East Grand Bahama, as an attorney, I guess I could share this. The minister shall. It doesn't say might. Um, and then it says such audit accounts. So if it says such audit accounts, it must be referring to the, the, the audit accounts um, spoke of prior. But I, I don't want to get into the debate, but I, 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 I take the note of East Grand Bahama. Yeah, I think uh, the my professional colleague very much. However, we will have to differ with the interpretation of that section because section five makes no obligation annually to- Three months after the end of each financial year. Um, I don't know how, how much more. Well, it, but I, I, I carry on, say, carry on, Senator. I'll finish with my, my Senator. Right. There's no obligation. Yes, it's three months after the end of each financial year for the authority to submit a copy of the reports to the minister. Yes. But there is no annual obligation, as you can, if you go down to seven, for the minister to lay it on the table of the House annually. I think that's the point raised by East Grand Bahama. Yeah, and well, 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 simply, that is what I'm saying. The okay. reporting requirements are minimum. And, and it's vague. It just needs clarification. And I think that, um, once again, I just think that there ought to be an obligation of the minister to lay the audited, and then not only audited accounts, an external audit account, or an independent audit of the accounts. And while, so those were two points I was raising. While you're on your, while you're on your feet on this point of audit, auditing, and, and I, I was going to wait till you finished, but while we're on the rebounds, I, I, I didn't want to end your, your little ride, your thrive. Um, I just want to caution you, though. Um, you're making a clarion call to your compliance colleagues. I just want to caution you and them that, you know, and I can use this term respectfully, to stay in their lane. Um, this parliament is... Uh, as its, as its rules, it's, it's, it's supported in, in the Constitution, uh, Section 55.1, which says that subject to divisions of this Constitution, each house may regulate its own procedures and for this purpose may make rules and procedures. In essence, um, the Constitution uh, makes provisions for this house, um, Parliament, Senate, and this house to make rules and regulations to govern itself. And yes, um, there is a rules committee um, I'm just saying, uh, because you made a statement, and I don't want it to go out there, um, that your compliance colleagues may, may even suggest in their minds that they could in any way um, attempt uh, to, to act as compliance officers um, for this honorable house or the Senate. Now, um, I, you might be saying that maybe they, every, every citizen has the right to raise issues with regards to how we... Um, how we um, enforce or how we treat our rules. But as I'm just saying respectfully, um, I want to caution you and them. Um, there we have provisions in the Constitution and our rules of how we govern ourselves in this Honorable House. Carry on. Um, the Chair recognizes the member for the, Freetown. The good member from Senateville makes a point about the independence of the auditors. It says the accounts of the authority, this is 17 subsection paragraph 2, the accounts of the authority shall be audited annually by independent auditors appointed by the Auditor General whose fees shall be paid by the authority. Now, there's some question about whether the Auditor General should be involved in the process, but that was left in there in order to ensure that in fact, independent auditors were selected. Now, yes, you can go out and get your Ernst & Young and your KPMGs and all the rest of it, but I just, I, I, I think that that oversight was just left in there. Check with the auditor. We want to pick KPMG. Auditor General says no problem. They get done. So that, that was just a oversight on who you were going to pick, not someone who was, may not be considered independent. So, for example, if Denisio Diagla had his own firm, and my cousin was the director general, 
I think the, that would, that's how the, the Auditor General wanted to provide some oversight to the selection of the independent auditors. But the fact is that that should be audited annually by independent auditors. That was what we attempted to do. Member for Senator. Great, thank you very much, uh, Freetown, for um, advising on the intention of the legislation. And, you know, I appreciate the comments and hopefully we can clarify that somewhere along the way. Um, you know, when I made a clarion call to Tobacco, we were, I, we were speaking and I am speaking, Sanville was speaking too, being a part of the national conversation on compliance, which in fact is very important to our national development. I mean, it has no relevance with anybody trying to step over somebody else's boundaries. Maybe that's our problem today, is that too many people believe that we, we are in some cocoon and, and are untouchable. And, that, and, you know, and this is one of the problems um, members of parliaments are facing today, is that, you know, we, we, we get into these positions and all of a sudden we become the authority and we just reach. So what we're talking about, here's ICAO, a huge compliance uh, model. And all I was suggesting was that the Bahamas Association of Compliance Officers need to stretch their wings a little bit in terms of helping not only the aviation industry or the maritime industry, but to help our country to become more, uh, com more of a compliant nation. And that was the suggestion that I was, was making. So, Mr. Speaker, most of this, uh, most of the, well, the compendium of bills appear to be in preparation for an aircraft registry. Mr. Speaker, we're still waiting on the land registry, notwithstanding that the minister mentioned thousands of acres of land being acquired for airport purposes, I think he stated. I had asked about the investigation into to the Quieting Titles Act of 1959, Mr. Speaker. And everyone knows that that request has nothing to do with whether the average Bahamian quieted land in accordance with the law. Mr. Speaker, what it has to do with is individuals and companies, and in some cases, foreign companies, abusing that law over the many years to the economic disadvantage to our country and the disenfranchisement and to the disenfranchisement of our people. I implore our judiciary to be vigilant, praying for their wisdom and their jurisprudence and their discernment. Mr. Speaker, the narrative of this piece of legislation today, however, should be focused on compliance and the overall need for our country to be domestically and internationally compliant. I couldn't help but notice the listing of some proposed candidates. Mr. Speaker, I encourage all of these candidates, all of these young persons who are, who are, <laughs> who are vying for political office. I just want our young people, though, to be careful about selling an old message, selling a party message that they themselves don't understand. I know I was there. I encourage all of them, all of you young politicians, the new ones, the older ones that are also new, to do and to be the very best you can. Think independently with an understanding for us, the Bahamian people. Think truth, think honesty, and then collective responsibility. You have a tough road ahead, 
And I am not talking about elections. I'm talking about a system that can't wait to dictate to you. A system that makes you feel you need them and they don't really need you. It's a dictatorial system. But we pray, God, your protection. Protection on all of you, as he marks the manner of your bearing. We pray he gives you all the courage and the strength necessary to stand. Stand for what is right. And to be compliant and deliberate when it comes to discernment and obedience. I'm actually looking forward to seeing all of you on the campaign trail. <laughs> Not only letting our people know what you will try to do for them, but most important, importantly, letting them know the how. See, these parties can tell you God there and say, they ain't gonna tell you how they're gonna do it. That's why they come every six months asking for more and more money, because they never figured out how they were going to do what the things they wanted to do. How, Mr. Speaker, is very important. Mr. Speaker, I spoke earlier about the Parliamentary Commission today, and in September, on September 14th, I would have submitted a letter to the Parliamentary Commissioner, Mr. Philip Turner at that time, and this is what this reads. Application in writing, symbol, independent candidate, Reese Chipman, MP. In accordance with the parliamentary election symbol and time off regulation, section 133, paragraph 43, under section 35 of the Parliamentary Elections Act, I, Reese Chipman, as a proposed independent candidate, are, am requesting the use of an election symbol other than the prescribed symbols. I seek approval of the parliamentary register for the use of this below system. So the Senate Bill Thumbs Up Award, as you would know, Mr. Speaker, has been around for a while. And now this is what the request is. So as soon as we get a substantive parliamentary commissioner, I would hope to have an answer, an answer for my request. God bless you all. God bless the people of Senneville and the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, for which we stand, one people united in love and service. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Senneville. I don't think you need a substantive parliamentary commissioner, but um, I pray that you will get one under the acting one. I'm sure you will. Um, thank you, Senneville. As many. Uh, the chair now recognizes the honorable member for South and Central and Mangrove Key, Andros. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. It's time to make a very brief intervention on the Civil Aviation Authority Companion of Bill 2021. On behalf of the fine people aforementioned by yourself, Mangrove Key, South and Central Andros. Airports, by their very nature, have played a major role in many parts of the world in allowing economies, sometimes national and at a regional level, to realize more economic potential than usual. Air transport, as compared to other modes of transportation, is relatively new, Mr. Deputy, but has grown rapidly in the latter half of the 20th century. It was particularly important for long and medium distance movements and travel of people and high value to low value volume commodities, regionally and globally in the global scheme of things. On the issue of air transport and economic development, airports are seldom if ever seen as a strict catalyst for local economic development. An area is only likely to enjoy substantial and sustained economic growth if it has an inherent potential to do so. Airports, by and large, are not freestanding entities, as they require complementary surface infrastructure. And even if they are developed, that is appropriate, not in appropriate location sometimes, on an appropriate level. They need, generally, good roads, good telecommunication, 
good ground transportation mechanism, an internal mechanism to facilitate, another internal mechanism to facilitate the unencumbered movement of people, commodities, and the prospects of expansion, which are necessary for economic growth and development to take place in the varying sectors of our world and also locally in our Commonwealth. There are also positive and negative external economic effects combined with numerous non-economic influences that determine whether and where an airport could be built, the scale of development, and its operational design. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to note at this juncture that by and large, we note the intervention in this and these in this companion of bills, and by and large, the regulatory regime is one that we have no major problem with, as espoused by the member for Freetown, who is the substantive minister of tourism. All we need is good airports across this country on a whole. Now, there are some primary effects that airports would generally bring to, in my view, to our Commonwealth. I would speak as an island representative this evening, Mr. Speaker. And the design of a, of a facility should consider local geophysical and environmental assessment in construction of its terminal, hangars, and runways in particular, and the resulting income and employment multipliers that could be associated therewith. Some of the secondary effects of an airport should be employment and maintaining the facility, handling of aircrafts and passengers, and transporting people and cargo in the local domain to and from the terminal, and also creating once again local employment, income generating, and most importantly, as we look forward into the 21st century, local governments should see returns and be further empowered through returns from the expansion and development of airports across our Grand Commonwealth. The concern of tax revenue, taxation revenue is a major one. And I note in the Civil Aviation Authority Bill 2021, under the, under the objections and reasons for the bill, Section 20 is of note to me, Mr. Deputy, and it says in Clause 20 of the bill, seeks to provide that at the end of each financial year, the surplus funds of the authority shall be paid into the consolid and consolidated funds unless the Minister of Finance authorizes otherwise. We are hoping that we can have good airports all over our Commonwealth. How good airports and ones that are operational in our farm the islands so that we can see good revenue generation in our farm the islands like we see here at LPIA and like the prospects now loans for the Exomas and also Long Island where those revenues could be generated locally and we could have some good tax returns that can also assist local government in its functioning and also real, real local government and empowerment in our farm the islands. The tertiary effects of a good airport will simply be these look at the stimulus at all levels of the economy, resulting from firms and individuals having airport services at their disposal and could lead to direct flights, business opportunities, and also interconnectivity. If you get good airports, good terminals, people want to be in them, they want to fly, they want to use them. More expansion repairs done locally and more international carriers, therefore, would utilize these facilities. Repair facilities should also be developed. Refueling capacity should also be expanded and also maybe for the first time installed. And also, another thing that is also good when one has good airports, and I speak more about airports than any other thing this afternoon, this evening, Mr. Speaker, is that it would lead to properly, proper safety trained professionals that can enhance aircraft registration in these lo local districts in our family islands. On the issue of financing airport infrastructure, especially in family islands, Mount Moriah, from a policy perspective, there are some good reasons to ensure that there's adequate air transport and it's available to facilitate economic development. As we know, there can also be some market imperfections that could also impede these happening. For example, they can look at the fact that we cannot put a good in the new airport terminal, Central Grand Bahama, in a community because it doesn't have enough bedroom, bedroom space. There's no local boutique, the Airbnb 
traffic is very small. The numbers of persons accessing your airport is very little. Other attractions are not there. The manpower and the train personnel very limited. Mr. Deputy, an airport outside of the regulatory regime, which I tell you generally we agree with, and I would concur with the earlier sentiments generally of the member of Anglis for Anglistan. I'm talking generally about the construct of an airport terminal, the importance of what it has to me as an island representative, especially the communities of Andros. If one were to arrive at the Tokyo International Airport, for example, or see the developments at Heathrow when one arrives in the United Kingdom, or even regionally, the developments that would have taken place in Antigua and Barbuda, namely Antigua at the BC Bird International Airport, the newly opened. Or when one comes, returns to the Bahamas, and especially here in New Providence, and comes to LPIA, and they've seen my Caribbean counterpart at that time, and I served as ambassador to the CARICOM, and how good they felt. And it gives you a good feeling and a level of effervescence and hubris that they felt so good about coming to the Bahamas when they saw an airport. And the developments when one goes to Miami and see the expansion and growth and development at Miami International, it gives us a good feeling of a model of an airport outside of the regulatory regime which the member for Freetown would get into and also the member for Angliston. And you heard about the trappings and extrapolations in the member for Centerville who spoke about the need for proper accountability. I need that. Before I get there, I need all those to come together in a conglomerate or come together as a companion partner, but I need a good airport also in my community. When one has a structure that has been there for the past 50 plus years and one almost has to bend his or her head to walk through the door, we need to go in a different direction. Generally, the cost, you hear things such as the cost are too high. Well, I must note the fact that, you know, I recently returned from a trip to the nation's second city, Grand Bahama Freeport to be exact, and seeing the condition at the airport in Grand Bahama was really mind-boggling. To see the jagged edges on the building as you one goes or come up or uh, disembarks the plane, the hurricane and the signs of all the ravages are still there in Freeport proper. He's saying that we must find a way to fix that as a Bahamian people. It will speak well of our country because we were always told when we were growing up, you never get a second chance to make a good impression. And when one lands and sees your airport is unkept, it doesn't look good. It doesn't say much about the Bahamas as we've been telling the world is better in the Bahamas and come to our shores. Our terminals must be at a certain standard. We must make them attractive. People should feel a welcoming warmth when they walk into our terminals. We always hear this issue of the cost is too high and this lack of business development, the productions of growth are not there. Infrastructural development not in place. Capacity is not domiciled, the resident of the communities, and there's too much urban pull out of the local community. Well, Mr. Deputy, we've got to find a way to fix that. I am one who's speaking from the family island perspective, and I'm going to keep it down home. Let's look at Fresh Creek. I think it's one of the Andros Town Airport, maybe one of the busiest in the community of Andros, one of our family islands outside of the Exumas and the Abacos. It needs a, it need a new terminal in Andros Town, Freetown. I'm glad you talk about the developments in Long Island. My deputy in the Exumas, Naughty Luthor, of course, they, know, they need it in Naughty Luthor. The Berry Islands, member for North Andros and the Berry Islands, I, I celebrate with them. But in a community where there's a deputy, some nine to $12 million disposable income, small and cottage industries and touristic development and resorts, salaries and boat fishing lodges, virtually in that community in a very fluid way. We need a better showpiece in Central Andros and Fresh Creek to be exact. It's an embarrassment to me as a member of Parliament to go into my area. And this goes across the political divide, the both governments, that we have not been able to construct a 21st century terminal in no part of Andros. The future beckons Andros. In any administration, the next government must have a ministry of Andros. Andros is the future of this country. Andros needs now a new frontier and a new life. We must have 
of peace in some part of Andros. And Mr. Deputy recommended a start between the clans of Green, Britain, and Mango Sea, the Congo Gang International Airport, or even in North Andros. But it must happen. It's good to have all the sophistry and other political speeches about the registration and the oversight and the transparency and this and that. But in the meantime, my people are languishing from the fact that we don't have proper facilities in Andros. We are sending revenue to the consolidated fund and to the treasury to say in a very down home kind of way. It doesn't reflect on what we're getting in return in no way in Andros. Our airports are in bad shape. And in the, and in the squall and in the rain, the tarmac is flooded in Fresh Creek. Lots of people, our terminals are too small. Inadequate screening facilities. International flights are landing and virtually nowhere for our visitors or guests to sit or habitat. Customs and baggage are holding facilities, the major concern. Especially in Mangove Key, my people that still don't have the port of entry status cleared yet. An airport named after a national treasure, a national hero, Clarence A. Bain. Still doesn't have have clearance facility at the port of entry after being promised by both sides of the political divide over the years. It's a crying shame. Once again, the same facilities exist. The need to be upgraded, repaired, renovated, and expanded in Mangrove Key Andros. In Congo Town, it's not always my birthplace and hometown. Grossly inadequate, limited seating facilities, no local screening at a certain professional level. Generally, it's a challenge to even keep the building up, up keep, um, there's no proper real upkeep for the building because of very limited funding with under, with under the ministry's purview. And local government by its very nature is challenged to do anything about the same. Andros needs new airport terminals. You don't get a second chance, Mr. Deputy, to make a good impression. Improve runways, airport facilities would lead to young Andrusians wanting to return home. We want to see the day East Grand Bahama. And I was glad when you were in your other life a part of the industry. I don't want to see the day when young men and women could stand in the terminals in Andros Town at the Clarence they being International Airport or the Congo Town International Airport in South Andra, my birthplace, and be properly dressed and attire like I see the young people at Bahamas Air, Western Air, Sky and Flamingo Air, they get LPIA. It does something to people's spirit and morale. It makes them feel good about their hometown and the prospect of further development and growth in these communities. We must consider these developments, Mr. Deputy, in these family islands. We continue to kick the ball down the proverbial road when we look at airport development in the family islands. We must do something post haste to remediate this process. I must digress very briefly and note the fact that today we saw nurses demonstrating in Roslyn Square. But I know the fact that I must tie this in quickly. We would also want my good friend, a member for Bamboo Town, to know that we'd also like to see good airlift for our people who might have challenges with health care and the family violence, and also to have those nurses and those who do the antigen testing expanded in these family island communities also, so that nurses who are regularly charged to carry their regular duties would not be tied down with antigen testing for those who come in as you're concerned about the COVID-19 and the pandemic internationally and its implications for us nationally. We would like to see the same happen to where we can have, continue to see good PPE, and we also fortify these family island communities with nurses and further medical practitioners in our family islands. But please, in the meantime, continue to strengthen the antigen testing program by using those school leavers and those young people who have remained in these family islands through training to continue the prospect of retaining of retention of the population in these local farm island communities. When one has a good terminal, when one has a good airport 
like the Zuma is going to get pretty shortly, and Naughty Luthra and the Berry Islands are going to get pretty shortly. It attracts good press. The world want to come and see it. They show me when I go to Northern Amsterdam, and you've got a good airport. People write about it. They take pictures. They put it on Facebook, Instagram, social media. They say, look where I'm standing. That's what I want to see happening in Andros. I want to see a showpiece that we have at LPIA, a smaller version in our family, and we can do it. We attract domestic and star-studded events to these local destinations. I have people coming into Tiamo in South Andros. Celebrities who are coming into South Andros and going into our bikes and creek in our estuaries. Only they virtually have the seat in a terminal that could only hold 10 persons. It's embarrassing for the member of parliament to see that. To see that. And they say to you, look who's in the airport. It's simple. It's simple. It's embarrassing. We must find a way to fix it. It's look, style, design becomes critically important to our country going forward. And of our people in these islands, as we talk about airports and developments, it's critical. We in the communities of Mango Key South and Central Andros, Mount Moria, we have two Western Air flights a week, Monday and Friday. People have business, want to come to, there's no bikes now in Central Andros and North Andros. <clears throat> Persons have become the new problem must traverse to do business, to do basic business dealings. The post office are, are a different, it's not a concern for me when you look at the post office in its present state. We need banks, we need some brick and mortar. In the meantime, as we transition into the, what I call the FinTech and the 21st century in banking. We say, we say thanks to Lee Air and Flamingo Air, but we don't have the benefit of having the national flag carrier in no part of my constituency. But we are thankful to those airlines who continue to survive these very challenging moments. Airports are therefore, Mr. Mr. Deputy, as I take my seat, airport facilities are undeniably vital to the future growth of Farm the Island. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy, I must note also something in the Civil Aviation Bill 2021, in the Objects and Reasons, and Clause 9, especially Clause 13, as we look at the bill to provide for the requirement to maintain the Bahamas civil aircraft register by the authority, and also Clause 13, the bill seeks to provide the suspension or revocation of registration in the public interest, the airlines, and what have you. But I thought I should say this quickly as I'm about to take my seat. We have been treating what I consider to be and people free town shadow of small craft operators very flippant, very flippantly, and sometimes it might be very unfairly. Because in many instances, without these small aircraft, and them being able to pick up and assist persons, especially in my community, many persons would die. And there would also be no economy. It facilitate many times persons who in these the, the various keys and districts in our Bahamas where no other bigger craft would go. Persons go to the airport. When you get to the airport this morning, you hear that charters have been suspended. When you get there another time, you hear now there's a new protocol for with the COVID testing protocol. When you get to the airport, they say today um, charters are not permitted because they didn't meet certain such requirements. And so almost every other two or three months, there's a new set of protocols or stipulations you're hearing when one arrives at the airport. I am saying to the member for Freetown, as we look at these regulations and the revocations and registration, the list goes on. I am talking about this from a very direct family island member of parliament perspective. We need to reconsider what is happening out there. Proper insurance is needed. Proper registration is needed, yes. But there needs to be like, I think the member for Angleson mentioned, a real sit down where we can talk with them. We don't want anyone to die accidentally because there was a proper protocol and maintenance in, in place. We don't want that to happen. But the reality, though, is that these five-seater Air Aztec or whatever craft they may be using plays a very pivotal role in the connectivity of our Commonwealth. 
where major aircrafts would not go. And many times I sit and listen with these small craft operators and hear their stories and the horrors they have to live through in our society. It is unfair. And I beg you, members of the side opposite, especially, I don't want to be named, they don't have to do that. I mentioned, I mentioned the hardship they face. You go down one day, today you say, okay, we go into Fresh Creek tomorrow morning. How many of you? Five. When you get to the airport, they say this morning you can't go because everyone needs to be insured or this needs to be done. Or the, the inspection process has changed where you have to do this and this. Whereas they would have been used, maybe it could use as someone who's a Bahamian who's doing this. They now must have an FAA this and I've heard all the stories. I don't know. I don't speak into that nomenclature. But I'm just telling you at the end of the day, I, know, I hear all the different discussions at the airport. And someone says to you, well, because of this, you have to use a different plane. Well, if you use a different plane, there's a different cost involved. And so you want to take people now to South Andros, Mount Moriah. You have two flights a week, Monday and Friday on Western Air, a larger craft. But if four or five persons want to take a smaller craft into Congo Town, unlike the member for North Africa who can have five, six planes a day because the economies of scale is doing much better than my community, my people are stuck in New Providence for many of them don't like to be in the first place. All the businessmen want to get back. They don't, want, they don't like being in town. That's the down home talk. They don't want to be here. They want to get back to the farm the island. So I'm saying to the member for Freetown, who has carriage, to consider these concerns, and that it's important for them to have a real dialogue. So when I go to General Aviation on Friday morning to go to Fresh Creek, I want them to hear these moans and concerns and the various trepidations and reticence that is exhibited or spoken to all the time. Ms. Uh, the chair recognizes the member for being in ground staff. I just want to um, add a point of clarification to the good member for Central and South Andrews. Uh, one are you, the... you going to yield to the minister? Oh, I thought he was. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the things, one of the number one concerns we have in aviation in terms of from the directors of general aviation is that we'll know that in aviation they are enough there are about three kinds of pilot permits so you have the private pilot you have the instrument rated and you have the commercial pilot a number of the major concerns that we're finding in aviation is that individuals who are operating with private pilot permit licenses are operating as commercial pilots which is a major breach to the ICAO policies and privileges of private pilots. Additionally, commercial pilots, depend on every aircraft that is used for hire, have a 100-hour inspection that, is, that are to be carried out. So if you're flying a C-6, which is a Bahamian, uh, Charlie 6, which is a Bahamian aircraft, or November registered, which is overseas, you have to fly to the place, to the mechanic, that is, auto, that is authorized to fix or to inspect that plane. So a number of times you have a, uh, individuals out there at, at, jet, at the general aviation who are overdue on inspection, 100 hour inspection, and the list goes on. These pose serious threats to local Bahamians who don't understand aviation in its entirety and what it really represents. So the safety and security is our number one uh, concern and yes we will be cracking down and zooming in on those individuals because at the end of the day it's about safety and security but I agree with the the good member from Andrus Central and South Andrus and that's definitely something we're working on thank you thank you I I listened to the member for Maine and Grand Strong as he navigated earlier <laughs> and I too would like to join him on the flight 770 <laughs> The in-flight emergency call to the governing side to pay attention to the importance of the need for this industry, especially terminals and their functionality and their, the need for the upgrading and expansion thereof in our farm balance to be considered. That's all I'm getting to. And I'm saying quickly, Mr. Deputy, if we were to continue to simply submit that farm the islands are important and improvements are needed, New terminals, either through government or what I call public-led initiatives or public-private partnership, 
We need to import, improve, pardon me, these airports, and we need to do it now so that we can all be proud of the final product. Safety being in Grand Stang is important. Safety is an imperative. We want our people, you don't want to go to any funeral from anybody from Morgan's Club to Mars Bay and Andros. I'd never want to go to one of those again. But, you know, I simply realize, and I live by this local, this slogan, I call it, we don't just fly there. We live there. I feel it. When it doesn't look good or feel good three times, I leave it. I live that. We don't just fly there. We live there. So today, as I once again take my seat, Mr. Deputy, the current call is 770. An emergency in flight emergency to the governing side. The need for upgrading and improvement and construction of new airport terminals to be expanded to the communities of Andros. Namely, in particular, the communities of Andros Town, Fresh Creek to be the exact. A new airport in beautiful Mangrove Key, named in the honor of the father, one of the fathers of our nation, the late Clarence A. Bain, and also a new one in Congo Town in South Andros. We support these companion bills and may the people of our Commonwealth continue to fly like the birds of the air and land in good, secure terminals and facilities that we can all be proud of, that we can move together with a collective mindset in the 21st century as we move forward, onward, upward, together, simply saying, we don't just fly there, we live here in our country down there. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy. Uh, thank you, Member for South Central, Mango Free Andros. As many. The, the chair recognizes the member for East Grand Bahama. I'll try to be brief. Um, yeah, I'll try to be brief. Mr. Speaker, the, the, these companion of bills are significantly important to the development of the, of the Bahamas, uh, given that we are an archipelagic nation and the need for air travel is vital to our development. And it is on that basis that I stand, recognizing first uh, that the airport in Long Island uh, is, has been an impediment to the growth and development of that island. And I would say that it's probably the, the, the most significant impediment that has held that island back. We see what has happened in Exuma with a facility that, was, that is much newer than the one in Long Island. And so we know that with the construction of not a, we're not asking, I don't think they, and I don't want to speak for the member for Long Island, but I don't think they're asking for a $40 million airport as is being proposed for Exuma or North Long Island, North uh, Eleuthera. But what they do want and what they do need is something that is adequate, that is safe, and that will uh, fit the purpose for which airports are designed. Mr. Speaker, I, I, you know, um, the, in speaking, with the, speaking about the airports in Exuma and, 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 and North Eleuthera, and I, at the risk of being uh, called stingy and Titus and all the rest of it, <laughs> one of the things that concerns me about the design of the airports that have been put forth, no doubt they will be excellent and wonderful edifices. But as we've seen with the Linden Finland Airport, the cost to operate those airports is tremendous. And it means that each and every one of us has to pay for those airports in the form of taxes on our airline tickets. What is important, and I, I don't want us to lose sight of this, and, 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 and uh, Saudi Andres, uh, I mentioned it just a minute ago, I don't know of any tourist, any traveler that travels to a destination because it has a nice airport. Now they have one in, I think it's Singapore, that looks like, you know, <laughs> that might be interesting to go to because you could spend a couple of days there. But nobody goes to 
a Caribbean destination because they got a nice airport. If they have a nice airport, that's wonderful. But you don't go there for that. And so what I'm saying is, let's not put our cookie jar a little bit higher than we could reach, that we could afford. We want safe. No, there's no point of order, man. Uh, no, we want safe. Yeah, you can't say that. Can I get it? Remember, one second, each grandpa. Let me just say it first. Deputy, I, was I, your, your, your point of order? My point of order is simply be this. I don't want the member for East Grand Bahama to misconstrue what I would have said. I don't, I, I never would have given him, wanted to give the impression that poisons travel to any destination because of the airport. <laughs> I'm saying that the first impression and the impression when one arrives at an airport says a lot about the destination. And that's the point I continue to make. We could have good destinations in the Bahamas, but about terminals, especially in a farm that is in such bad or poorly maintained state, it has an impact on how people perceive our local communities. That's why I feel very strong. Thank that. you. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that's the right to do that. this point. I, I wasn't trying to, to, to <laughs> ascribe it. I just want to make the point. And I hope I've been able to, to, to make that point. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to congratulate the people of Long Island. And, and I certainly want to pray, hope and pray, uh, that they will get that airport because they've been, it's been a long, long time coming. Uh, and, and we know about promises. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I, could not, <laughs> I could not speak about Long Island Airport without speaking about the Grand Bahama International Airport. And Mr. Speaker, that is a private airport at the moment. Uh, there's been talk, and again, along the same lines of promises, that the government will acquire the airport and have it redeveloped for, uh, uh, um, for use. Mr. Speaker, like Long Island, like Exuma, like North Eleuthera, and all the rest of them, this is a vital piece of infrastructure. What we have been reduced to as a result of Hurricane Dorian is I want to use the word embarrassment, and I don't know if that's a strong word. But from what we have come to, what we've been used to, and what we deserve as the quote-unquote second city in the nation, what is being allowed to happen there is unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. And I want to impress upon the government that we need to act with a bit more urgency in terms of dealing with that matter. I don't know what the, the impediments are, but I do know that is within our ability to fix it. Mr. Speaker, with all of these airports, as the, the minister would have said, funds are limited. And I've suggested that maybe we ought to look at a modular approach to all of these airports, such that we're able to bring them up to a level that is acceptable. Maguana Airport is a disaster, an embarrassment. The member spoke about Santa Andres. Cat Island, All, most of the airports in the family islands are unacceptable. And I think it's, it's, it's unfair to them, because they pay taxes too. It's unfair to them that some should have quote unquote showpieces and others should be suffering in sun and rain, cold, whatever. We gotta do better as a nation, this is a Bahamas, the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And we have to share the resources because everybody deserves to have those basic comforts uh, and infrastructure that would help them to develop. And so, Mr. Speaker, in respect to Grand Bahama, again, I want to encourage the government, whatever the hurdle is that we need to cross in order to get that airport back into some shape, that we can have the services that we are uh, accustomed to, that we deserve, that will support the development of the island and the population of that island, we need to get on with it. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to just say in respect to the, the bills, the, I note that in the, in the bills, the minister, the minister of tourism and aviation is still the minister with respect to all of these agencies, licensing and operation. Air accident and investigation was removed from the ministry, as it should be. I dare say that there is a challenge here, even though they've broken it up in different acts, that the minister is still the same minister, meaning that he is inherently conflicted uh, in the operations of these various bills. I think it's something that needs to be looked at. Most significantly, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that the minister 
that is in charge or charged with these bills is also the minister for the national airline, Bahamas Air. Again, an inherent conflict of interest. Uh, it, it is, <laughs> I, I don't know if they'll let you get rid of it, <laughs> but it is an inherent conflict. Uh, and Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, there are consequences to those conflicts. And I'll leave that there. But I think it's something that, again, uh, by law, ought to be defined and segregated, not by policy, because we, we know how policy goes, but by law. No minister in charge of an operation, and it speaks to it here in the bill, you know, about the board of directors. No minister that is charged with the regulate, regulatory aspects of the industry ought to also be responsible for, the, for an operating entity. I leave it for the ministers, to the government to, to consider. Mr. Speaker, I wanted to um, speak to just a couple of thing, other things in the bill. Um, I note, Mr. Speaker, in, in item 14, uh, about the powers of the authorities to borrow. And I just wanted to congratulate and commend the government for uh, um, item 14, uh, uh, five. Uh, this is the, I'm looking at the air navigation bill. Um, in item, item 14.5, where it speaks about the approval by the minister or the minister, or the minister of finance under the section, under the section may be general, no, sorry, not that one, um, four, where it says the authority after obtaining the approval of the minister uh, may invest. The, the, point, the, the, the point that I wanted to, to, to con con actually it's number three, I'm sorry. Uh, the borrowing powers of the authority shall be exercisable only with the approval of the minister given with the consent of the Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, this is important because what we've had over the years is a bit of a runaway by all of these authorities and state-owned enterprises where they enter into commitments without the uh, 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 informed consent of the Ministry of Finance. And we find ourselves having uh, obligations that are not tied into the national strategy uh, in respect to the finances of the nation. And so I think that's very good. And I just wanted to, 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 to uh, congratulate the government on it. Um, Mr. Speaker, the, in, in item number 17 of this bill, and I'm using this as my lead bill, uh, it speaks to the reporting. Um, item number 17.3, sorry, item number 17.2, uh, says that the independent auditors appointed by the Auditor General. Mr. Speaker, that is unusual. The Auditor General does not appoint independent auditors. Now he can, as the Auditor General, uh, hire an independent audit firm to carry out uh, audits on his behalf. But he doesn't go out and hire independent audits, auditors uh, for the purposes of, of auditing authority. Secondly, Mr. Speaker, this is a power that is normally vested in the Board of Directors. I would suggest that the government may want to consider amending that clause to make it a board responsibility. Because in effect, you are absolving the board of their responsibility. Uh, the 17-2, uh, the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority. This is their, this is their responsibility. Uh, and I don't know that the Auditor General should accept that responsibility uh, uh, technically the Auditor General does not audit authorities. Uh, he audits government agencies and ministries uh, and independent auditors um, selected by the board uh, are normally appointed to, to, to audit these authorities. And so I'd just like to uh, suggest that. Uh, Mr. Speaker, on the same uh, area, item number three and number five uh, seem to be saying the exact same thing. Uh, I don't know if I understand the, diff the differences between the two of them, and they may want to maybe just be a matter of them consolidating the two points. Um, although one says 90 days and the other says three months. I don't know exactly what, and in terms of uh, submitting these reports. Uh, I think just uh, a, a bit of cleaning up can be done there. Uh, the other thing is in terms of item number four, where it speaks about the elements of a, finan of a, a financial report. Um, I think that there is some clarification um, that, that may you may want to put there. You don't have to, 
because uh, it may be covered under the such other information as the minister may require, but it's an audit balance sheet, a statement of income and expenditures, and I think it's a statement of comprehensive income and expenditure. There's no mention of a cash flow. There's no mention of equity. Uh, in other words, when you start detailing like that, uh, you tend to leave out some things. Uh, I'm not so sure that that's what you want to do. You might just want to say a financial statement. I don't know. Uh, again, for you to consider. <laughs> I'm trying to be brief. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Mr. Speaker, we, we spoke about, uh, the member for, member for Centerville spoke about the uh, submission of the reports to the Parliament uh, by the Minister. Uh, and he was on a point, but I, I think he might have missed it just a little bit, uh, in that the, uh, there's no, no timeline for when the financial statements are to be presented to Parliament. Um, and I was trying to remember uh, what is the normal period of time um, that, that audited financial statements are to be laid in Parliament. Uh, but I do believe that should be defined in the law. Otherwise, you're going to find, just like with all the other authorities, uh, or let's say all, a lot of the other authorities, it just lingers on and on and on. And then after this parliament is long gone, somebody is going to present a financial statement from 2000, uh, uh, 2021. I think we can, we can, uh, we should, we should clarify it in the law so there's no, um, no, no ambig ambiguity about what is required. Um, the, the, the other question I had was about the auditor general again. If he is the, the person appointing the auditor, then what is, who, is he, who is the auditors reporting to? The Auditor General, or to the Board, or to the Minister, or to the Parliament? Who are they reporting to? Um, again, he who appoints, disappoints, or yeah, removes, or can, exactly. Um, Mr. Speaker, I, I note the, again, I want to congratulate the government for moving forward with the Air Services Agreement. I think that is a, an area that we've been talking about, certainly since I've been in Parliament, uh, and it is, it is uh, hopeful, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're going to see some positive movement uh, on that uh, very shortly because the revenue, which is uh, uh, vitally needed, um, uh, is certainly going to help with some of the situations that we have. Um, the, uh, this is a question I had uh, in it is item number 23 again, of the Navigation Services Bill, uh, the imposition of statutory liens. And it, spoke, it speaks about um, if a, uh, an operator doesn't pay his fees or whatever on an aircraft, that the, the authority can uh, impose a lien on an aircraft. Mr. Speaker, these things, as I understand it and, and, and uh, um, I recollect, are covered by the Cape Town Convention or um, immovable, or immovable pro property. Uh, aircrafts are movable, meaning that if you put a lien on the aircraft, they pick it up and they go, and they do whatever they do with it. Um, and I don't know, and maybe the minister will tell us, whether we've signed on to the Cape Town Convention. Uh, I am not so sure about that. That is a major impediment, Mr. Speaker, because it speaks to or limits our ability to uh, take full advantage of a Bahamian registry. That is, to be able to issue mortgages, to be able to insure uh, and to have all of the brokerage services that goes around uh, selling and, 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 and leasing of aircraft. Uh, and so if we're, if we're serious about this, then I think we have to uh, get into that area and sign on to that convention so that we take full effect uh, of, the, of the, um, the opportunity. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, looking at the schedule, um, the, yeah, the, the schedule, uh, which speaks about the organization of the board. I note, Mr. Speaker, that the, the item number one speaks to the number of persons on a board. And it says in one, subsection one, the board shall consist of not less than three or more than five persons appointed by the minister to be members of the board, one of whom shall be the director ex officio. And the problem that I have is that, say that a government decides that they only want three directors or three members of the board. One is the director ex officio. So you now only have two. And one will be the chairman, and one will be the vice chairman. Well, who's going to vote? <laughs> and it goes on to say that the chairman should be the tiebreaker. So I, I, I appreciate small boards, but I, I think uh, we might want to rethink that one. 
there may be a minimum of five, maximum of seven, uh, which would give a bit more objectivity uh, uh, and, and independence to the board. Uh, the, uh, to, to just have, uh, again, two, <laughs> I think is, uh, is awfully limiting. Um, so I would want to suggest to the, to the uh, um, minister that he might want to look at that. The, 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 in item number one four, subsection four, it speaks about the qualities of the persons that are to be uh, appointed. I have no difficulty, Mr. Speaker, save that uh, having some experience in this area, having outside eyes and ears to ask the silly questions is important. Uh, and, you know, uh, even, I don't know if this covers an aviation mechanic. I don't know if it covers ground staff, customer service agents, people who may have a perspective uh, on the industry um, that is not necessarily the pilot or the uh, uh, director of, of, of flight operations or whoever. Uh, so again, um, it may be included in such other persons or, or any related field, but again, uh, I just want the, the, the minister to, to consider it um, in, in, in the makeup um, and make sure that we're not excluding people who may have something to contribute in respect to uh, the, the, the entire picture of, of the aviation industry. Uh, Mr. Speaker, number five um, uh, speaks in, in, the, in, the, in the schedule, uh, speaks about um, persons with a financial interest um, and items number two and three seems to contradict item number one, because if the board member uh, is not allowed to have a, an interest in any aviation um, activity, then it seems to me two and three becomes irrelevant because they just don't apply. Uh, so again, um, minister may just want to look at them and see uh, uh, whether that is something that um, should be looked at. Uh, I think this is my last point, Mr. Speaker, in respect to item number seven under the business plan, uh, 7H. It says the expectation of the government that, uh, that the authority will pay a reasonable dividend. Again, as I understand these fees, Mr. Speaker, uh, they are only allowed to be charged to recoup cost to do with navigational um, services the cost to provide national navigational services. In other words, it's supposed to be reimbursement, cost reimbursement, uh, not to make profit um, such that there would arise a dividend. Um, in, in respect to, uh, even in respect to the over, 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 flight, over flight fees, I think there's a challenge uh, because again, it is cost recovery, uh, not um, to make profit. So, Again, I don't know if the wording is intended to mean that, uh, and I think that actually the bill speaks to it at some point, um, about whether surpluses from one year to the next uh, ought to be um, carried over rather than uh, being reimbursed that they be carried over to the next year. Um, but the idea behind these fees, all of these aer aeronautical fees um, is, is that they're cost recovery. Um, and that is not unique to this, to us in the Bahamas, that's an international standard. Uh, and so again, I think it's something to be, to be looked at uh, in terms of the words dividends, uh, because theoretically, there should be no dividends. So again, Mr. Speaker, with those couple of, uh, of words, I want to uh, commend uh, the minister for bringing these bills forward, uh, for uh, creating the, the uh, separation of, of, of uh, powers uh, uh, with the um, a few points that I've ra raised that may improve upon the, the, the intention of the bills. Uh, I want to just address the issue with compliance officers that the, minister, the member for Centerville mentioned. The, the whole idea of the uh, authorities uh, and the professionals involved in the inspection uh, um, operations at aviation is that they are in fact the compliance officers that's their job they are further supervised or 
quality check by the IKO audits, by FAA audits, uh, and, and, and even the Auditor General, uh, who will come in, an internal audit that will come in and look at processes. So uh, I don't want anybody to go away thinking that this is not a highly regulated, highly technical area. Uh, uh, and certainly financial services audit and compliance offices would be lost in this. Uh, and so I don't think that is something that we, we can put on them, Mr. Speaker. Lastly, Mr. Speaker, as I take my seat, uh, the member for English and spoke about um, the need for development in the inner city. Um, Mr. Speaker, I just want to say that the Bahamas, the, the government of the Bahamas, this government of the Bahamas, has made tremendous investment in the social and in the commercial uh, um, uh, sectors since its election. One, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Minister of Social Services, the Minister for National Insurance, have spoken in this parliament repeatedly about the level of support that we have given to individuals. The Prime Minister has spoken about the over the hill initiatives that will come and hopefully will benefit those individuals if they're able to take advantage of them. Mr. Speaker, I'm very proud of the work that we've done at the Ministry of Finance through the Small Business Development Center and what we've been able to do to empower over 500 people, entrepreneurs, to get into business or to get grants and loans to be able to expand their business. Direct support, Mr. Speaker. And so I think it would be unfair to say that this government has not supported the less uh, um, advantaged persons in this community, that they have not supported the middle class in this community, and they have not supported a vision towards the development and empowerment of our people. And so, Mr. Speaker, um, with those few words, I again want to commend the minister and the, the government for bringing this forward. Uh, I look forward to the further development of this area because I do agree this is a rich area that we can take advantage of. The, the, the uh, countries around us are taking advantage of the opportunities. We have to get with it, recognize that we are part of the global community, that we can take advantage of it. As somebody said, the talents of Bahamians are, are boundless. Uh, and if given the opportunity, given the framework, uh, that they will do wonders and make us so proud. So again, Mr. Speaker, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Member Pacento. Sorry, for East Grand Bahama. Um, Chair, can I just yes. on? Yes. on a point of clarification. I think the member misunderstood my speech. I was not speaking about programs, projects, that type of uh, approach. What I'm speaking about is a structural radical reform of how we address social and economic issues. That's what I was talking about. I'm not talking about the urban renewal. I'm talking about the over-the-hill project. I'm talking about a structural radical reform. That I'm an advocate of that. Some people probably don't understand it, but that is what I, that is what I was speaking to. I didn't say you didn't spend some money on some things. <laughs> you probably did. I'm, I'm speaking about a, a much more fundamental, um, um, transformational, paradigm shift in development and national development. That's what I'm talking about. And it's the eradication of poverty, not giving some loans to, to 100 people. Thank it's you. the eradication of poverty, looking at housing and looking at health care, looking at education. And I thought I made that clear, but I, I, I wasn't up here. That, that, yes, okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Um, East Grand Bahama? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, again, I, unless it be, be missed, the government's thrust into the small business development uh, uh, support in this country is all about the things that the member is speaking about. Creating a radical shift in the, the composition of the wealth in this country. It is talking about empowering those persons who to, up to now had not had access to the economic pie because they could not get started, Mr. Speaker. And so I, I, I want to make sure that that is, that is a, 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 that people understand. Thank you. This isn't about giving a couple of dollars no, no, to anybody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, 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 we, no, we, no this, that ain't happening tonight. 
It is not happening. You made, he, you made, a, he, you made a response to what you, and you already answered it. He already did a report. We're not going back and forth on this. You, no, because he hasn't, he hasn't said anything that, 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 that was against what you said. He was merely, so, I was done. We're not going, as many, as many, as many. I understand. We're not, we're not doing that tonight. We're not going to be on this for 50. We can't be back and forth. He didn't. He responded to you, and that was a simple response. Yes, yes. Um, the, the chair recognizes the member for Anglister. I'm oh, sorry. The chair recognizes the member for Bamboo Town. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy. Mr. Deputy, I do. I, One second. I move that the business of this house do continue beyond 7 p.m. tonight. Second. 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 The business of this house um, continues beyond the 7 o'clock hour. As many members are in favor, remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The business of this house will carry on beyond the seven o'clock, seven p.m. hour. As many, the chair recognizes the good member for, for Pine Ridge. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy. It is not my intention to be before you very long. I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises um, okay. shall continually be in my mouth. Yes. I think your podium is Tom Pamela. The podium is going to fall. Oh. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Mr. Deputy, it's not my intention to be before this August body very long, but just long enough to make one or two points in one or two areas and then specifically to this bill. Let me say how I am indeed grateful to the gracious and kind people of Pine Ridge who have afforded me this opportunity to stand where I stand and to speak on their behalf and by extension, the people of Grand Bahama. Today, it, it puts us in a precarious, well, it puts me in a precarious position because sometimes I have to choose between what a minister says and what the people say. And it's unfortunately, but I've reached the point that, and I think most people in this country have reached the point that if a minister says it and the people say it, they tend to go with the people. It, be, it behooves me that people would stand up in this weather and demonstrate downtown on Bay Street, claiming that they have not been paid. And then the minister says, oh, the nurses have been paid. So I don't understand. And at the same time, Anglistan, whereas you mentioned about the reserve officers, it was brought to my attention that they just received the check on Friday Park. But, when, but that, that's what I was informed, that some of them uh, have received uh, uh, a chair, check on Friday Park. One second, Pam, Rich. Now, the chair, the chair on the point, the, on the, point, on the, on the, point, the, the member from Omari is acknowledged. Yeah, I, I know he gets a call, because I... Thank you so much. Deputy Speaker. Members, 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 let's hear Omari, please. Again, yeah. in this honorable house, persons who we continue to refer to as honorable will come to this house and speak in parables. Yeah, I, 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 you, all you have to do is come. Yeah, you know that? Bring, bring your facts. No, you bring, no, because you made comments, remember? Remember, 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 Mariah. Um, the chair recognizes Bob Mariah. 
Thank you so much. He's still on his point of, I just asked him to say. Thank you so much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Deputy Speaker, you know, whenever I stand, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I speak to something, I have factual documentation to prove it. We're taking advantage of this honorable house and mis to mislead the Bahamian people constantly, some of us. We have to move beyond that. We talk about, we speak on behalf of the people. What people? Mr. Um, the the, the Mr. Yeah. As again. I don't know. Mr. I, I think the, I, before you speak, um, I, I know we're all familiar with this rule because we, we, all, we always come in and can talk with it. Um, about speak, about imputing on the reputation um, of members. Now, if, if, a, if a member of the government makes a statement in this honorable house, and this is supposed to be what, hold on, listen. The, the issue is, let's be cognizant of the fact of the rules that we operate as honorable members. If a member of the government makes a st statement, um, notwithstanding what you may hear, I, I think we have to be careful how we come back in this house, how we come back in this house and, um, and, and make a statement to that, to, that, to, to that effect. Now, all I'm saying, I can't tell you what to say, my member for Pine Ridge, but I'm just saying, be cognizant of the rules of, of, of how, we, how we respect each other uh, in this house. Um, I'm just asking you to be cognizant, yeah. because I'm, I'm a member of the government makes a statement. You know, and, 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 and it is. And it's, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy's gone to the point where people obviously observe. I simply said that the reserve officers, as Anderson had made her point, had been paid on Friday past. Not some of them, but okay. But I indicated that. Now, I don't know how you want me to prove. You must be want me to go get the reserve officer base step and bring it in here. I mean, I, I, you know, and you know, let me carry on. Let me get to the point that I really want to get to. I started by saying, oh, well, you're point of order, Mama Ryan. Chair recognizes you. Thank you so much. The member stood up of the team, okay? Now we know if you, okay, the matter that the member for Anglesburg raised earlier <laughs> has nothing to do with them being paid for the work that they're doing now. It was a specific reference. And so for the member of yes, Pine Ridge, that person may to have stand been up and give the that's impression as if that's these right. matters are related. Okay, oh, and he ought to correct himself. Bring the back or shut up. No, well, 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 one second, one second, one second, one second. I'm not even going to, um, for the record, can we strike from the record the, the, the word, the last words of the good member for my... I apologize, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Please have the member bring it back. Yes. Different matters. We got that point. We got the point. Thank you, Mom Mariah. Um, for the record, um, of the, the, the two last words of the member for Mom Mariah struck in from the records. Um, you know, sponged. obviously, I, I, I really get the waters running. Stop. You know, <laughs> so, 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 Walter Scott said, Oh, what a tangle web we weave yes. when first we practice to the sea. Again, uh, again, one, one, one second, one second, one second, one second. Mom Mariah. No, sorry, not Mom Mariah. Pine Ridge. Again, I'm, I, I haven't heard the rest of your statement, but we will be minded of what I said just a few minutes ago. Let me make it. Let me make it. Yeah, okay. Let me make it. That's right. That's a, oh, one second. I, I, I have members from the floor. This is the people's house, but people expect for us to govern ourselves yes. accordingly. And it's people. All right? And, and while I get here, I, you don't have to be on your feet to make comments for the chair to hear. The chair responsibility is to govern and have control of this house under the rules of this house. And if we can call ourselves honorable, as long as this chair, and I'm sure the honorable speaker shares my, my sentiments, we're going to act and be honorable. Can't stand on your feet and say, I'm representing this constituency and that constituency, and I'm an honorable member, and the member's honorable member, I and mean, when you don't act honorably when you're on your feet. Again, your caution. I, I, I haven't heard the rest of your statement, but I, I the Mr. same speaker, thing. I, I had asked earlier, and I mentioned how nurses were standing out in the cold today, yes. and that they were there 
they were nurses. When I made an inquiry, I got a very insulting, more or less, response from Bamboo Town and telling us we're uneducated and didn't know what we were saying as it relates to the nurses. And nurses are nurses, but I found out that there are nurses that are serving under the PHA, the Public Health Authority, but there are also nurses that are operating under the Department of Public Health. And I wish to ask the member for Bamboo Town, have the members from the DPH, have they been paid? The nurses. Bamboo Town, I have a seat because you said these folks standing out there were paid. Uh, um, you asked the member the, the yearly as in the, um, you, you, I mean, you're yielding to him, but he has a response. You can carry on. Thank you. So, Bahamas, as we see through you, Mr. Deputy, again, we were being under this, I call that a deceptive umbrella, to make believe that the, the nurses are being paid. Again, again, again. Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Well, the chair recognizes Bamboo Town. First of all, Mr. Deputy, I never said the member was uneducated, okay? That's not the term I use. Nonetheless, Mr. Deputy, I also said earlier today that the nurses for PHA are paid, and they are paid, Mr. Deputy, because unlike in the public service, the nurses who are part of the PHA, they go to PMH with a swipe card, with an AccuStar system, it is swiped, so their time is long. There is no question of that. Accurate. I also said, Mr. Deputy, that there's a difference between the nurses in the Department of Public Health. In government, there is no ACU system where someone goes into a public clinic and swipes a card to say, Renwood Wells nurse is working. That time, Mr. Deputy, is long in one piece of sheet. So when Renwood comes in, whether the log is logged or not logged, the way it is calculated is at some point in time, along the way, that extra time is put into the system and validated by the nurses inside the clinic and sent on to the ministry where it is signed off by the PNO, it is then signed off by the permanent secretary is signed off by the financial officer. It is a very lengthy process, and there is no digital record of it other than a piece of paper. I became minister in July. I understood that there were nurses in the Department of Public Health who some were not paid for Dorian, and some were not paid from March, for COVID. As minister, under the direction of the prime minister, I asked the Ministry of Health, I said all those documents that should have been law, Mr. Deputy, should have been law. So if you work in March, there should have been a log of all the persons who worked in March and all the persons who worked over time. It should not have been a question. In September, I asked that all of that be law, the quantum, the cost, be given to this minister in a cabinet paper to go to the cabinet so that the cabinet make a decision to pay. The paid. cabinet paper was written. I was told that the $162,000 that this minister went to the cabinet to ask to pay the nurses for March to September was only the logs for the work. The logs for the work. And that was paid. That's on record. We come into the new year, and all of a sudden, some nurses come and they say, We worked, but we were not paid. We worked, but we were not paid. So this minister then said, How is that possible? How is that possible? So, so we then undertook to assess 
the entire situation and to see if the claims that are now being made are accurate. And if it is, Mr. Deputy, I said, just like we made the undertaking to pay them and we have paid them, we will correct the record. Let me also say, Mr. Deputy, the nurses are the only frontline health workers who receive overtime pay. Doctors ain't get it yet. How do you support staff, the janitors, and everybody else? But we undertook to pay them. Mr. Deputy, that's the record. I, I thank you, Bamboo. I, I, I hope that, and I allowed the member for Bamboo Town to explain himself very clearly because of your strong accusations or the strong statements being made. Uh, and I, I, know, I hope there was some clarification. I just want to point, Mr. Deputy. Bamboo Town. The member one, one second, Prime Minister. I'm going to give him one. Your time that, is, is held. That member needs to take back the accusation that I am deceptive. <laughs> that goes against the rules of this house. And you know, there's a there's a long standing there's a long standing honourable understanding inside this house. I call it a that when a minister, when I used to sit over there on the back side. Um, did you hear? Did you hear my statement? So I, I this, is, this is a part of of of, of of what needs to be said in regards to what he said about being deceptive. When ministers speak inside the house <coughs> to their remit, unless you could bring a piece of paper that says otherwise, we'll fix up that. Oh, so we just. That's the way it was done. And for the member to come and say this member is deceptive, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy, he needs to take that. I've never called him. That goes against, that goes against never all the rules of the um, He's an honorable member. He should he be honorable. I am, and I did not He's call him deceptive. No, no less. I say he's a, he's a, a, I quoted um, about this. There, there was a, there was a, a, a to Bamboo Town. There was a, there was, there was a, that, that is the precise, and I'm not for the record. Uh, my job is to, to, the chair and to refer the members to the rules and keep, try to keep us managed in that. And that's the reason why Bamboo Town, I intentionally made the point that you clarified that, um, specifically mentioning when a government member, a government minister, um, makes a statement in his honorable house. And, um, and that's why I cautioned the member for Pine Ridge with respect to his statement. And um, um, member for Pine Ridge, um, I, I hear you on your, on your seat um, clarifying the point um, uh, that you did not call the, the member. What, you, you, you're... He said he didn't call me uneducated. I didn't call him. Deceptive. Now, I you... made a statement yes. indicating from Walter Scott saying, Oh, what a tangled web we weave when at first we practice the seed. Now, I thank the minister for your explanation and for giving... So you're not calling the member deceptive then? No, I'm not. I'm not. And that, that could be applied for many things that we sometimes... That is done in this place. But, <laughs> I'm not saying, but no, let me finish the statement. I'm just saying. No. I've even heard that statement used in here before. It is a quote... You're not uh, disappointed. That's no, I'm not, you're not calling the member for Bamboo Town deceptive? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Bamboo right. Town, uh, the, the chair will accept okay. that. Uh, the chair will accept that, that the member of Pine Ridge is not um, calling the good member for, Pine, for Bamboo Town um, deceptive. And, 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 and we I, all accept that it would not be an honorable thing, and that's right. not going to be tolerated. No. And I want to thank the member for Bamboo Town for the explanation. But at the end of the day, the explanation still warrants the fact that the persons that were out there feel, whether you feel it to be or you have to legitimize uh, quantify. But the, the, member, the, the minister just explained it, and I think no, and I want everybody to understood to why, why there was the... Let's start, let's start uh, it over. Uh, okay? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you don't have, don't have to read. You don't have to read that again. You don't have to read. Uh, carry on. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> moving right along and dealing with this bill. <laughs> what I really wanted to... I, I promised that I would not be long and I don't intend to be long, but to speak about the fact that the airports in Grand Bahama is atrocious. For the second city, for the second largest population on, in this archipelago, and the fact that Grand Bahama, despite its economic hard times and hardship, has paid well its taxes into the consolidated funds of the government of the Bahamas. It has still, despite its hard time, given more and contributed more for a very long time uh, 
here in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Despite our shortcomings economically and our hardship, the government of the Bahamas has always relied on the people of Grand Bahama to do their part in terms of taxation and being supported. And so uh, Grand Bahama feel like it's getting the very bad end of the stick right about now. Whereas we appreciate what you're doing for the other family islands and what you're doing to increase uh, the development in terms of infrastructure for airports in the family islands. I do think that Grand Bahama, based on its populace and its contribution of taxation, ought to be a priority and should be. Let me also bring it to the attention that I've always said that there seems to be a lack of vision or cohesive vision between the Grand Bahama Port Authority and the government in terms as to where it wants to take Grand Bahama and, when, and where Grand Bahama ought to be. But I need to bring it to the attention of this body that people have become very frustrated, really tired and feel like we're being treated like a stepchild. But you know, when St. George was alive, he seemed to have a vision and many seem to believe that the vision died with him. Hutchinson went poor, and I'm reliably informed, Mr. Edward St. George gave Hutchinson went poor the airport for one dollar. One dollar. I don't believe that the government should pay any more than one dollar. Quite frankly, at this point, maybe even 50 cents or nothing. The Grand Bahama Airport is the gateway. It is the first thing that people see landing. And I would hope that, again, Hutchison has not collected insurance money and about to bamboozle or hoodwink us, and this is my opinion, as we have been with the hotel where they take the money, they got the money, and at the end of the day, they tell you, government, go ahead, you could have this, uh, but you're gonna have to spend money to fix it up and not even give a dime. Grand Bahamians are frustrated and tired of holding the bag. And maybe as a result of this, you know, you can say what you like about past government. But very few of those governments, if any, have ever been termed as incompetent. I don't know, maybe it's the way we structure our deals, maybe it's the way we uh, do our negotiations, but it has left this government looking may, on many occasions as incompetent. May not be your fault, not your intention, but it's what comes, that's how it comes off. Reality will set in. Keep thinking. Keep thinking it's just from me. Because the more you attack me and say it's just from me, there are many behemoths out there thinking just like me. And when you say that and they hear that, they take that as not an insult to me, but to them. But to them. To them. No, I'm not smarter than everybody else. Okay? But if I were you, I would... you. Former police officer, discipline yourself. No, 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 Discipline yourself. One, one second, one second. Ma before before you speak, Mama Mariah, before, I, I, I understand you. Listen, discipline listen. Ma yes. one, one second, Mama Mariah, one second. Uh, Pine Ridge, Pine Ridge, a member for Pine Ridge. Ma 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 member for Pine Ridge. Yes, sir, I'll take the rebuke on that, sir. You can take the rebuke on I'll that. Take the rebuke from you on that. Member, member. And I withdraw. Remember. Withdraw. withdraw. Okay, withdraw. thank you very much. I withdraw. Um, the, yeah, the, the member for Pine Ridge withdraws the, the, the former statement. But I'm still going to allow Mom Mariah within reason to respond. He withdrew this, the statement. This is, Mr. Speaker, this is a comedy show of Mama proportion. The member for Pine Ridge continues to stand here and pro proclaim that he's speaking on behalf of the people. I'm yet to see the people he's speaking on behalf. Time will tell what people he will be. Oh, let me let me finish, member. 
Time will tell which people on whose behalf you speak it, because I don't see no one following you. Um, carry on, I'm part of Rich. You know, leaders have followers. Yeah, well, you know what? Yeah, well, every speech I put up got 10,000 more views. 10,000 views. 10,000 views. Ma'am, 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 can you speak to the chair, please? Ma'am, 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 speak to the chair. I'm going to your page. Make sure you watch out who's following you. Make sure who's following you. Some of your officers ain't even following you. Yeah, who's following you? That is true. That is true. That is true. We don't have 72 men, but that is true. And time, and time which, time which, time which, can you speak, speak to the chair, please? So. Time which works for, time will work for all of us. And all of us will have to give an account when it comes to time. You need to take your medication. Well, I like to drink. Carry on, time which, carry on, carry on, please. Mr. Deputy, I am saying, I am saying, thank you for calling me a false prophet. Because when you call me a false prophet, it makes me recognize I'm on the right track. When people like you do that, that's good. People like you say, I'm a false prophet, I'm not a Christian. Member, 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 member for Pine Ridge. Can you please? Um, again, Pine Ridge. Um, you know, it's the language I... I, I, I Pine, Pine Ridge, yeah. member for, on, honorable member for Pine Ridge. Again, this is like the fifth time, and I, I think. Yes, Mr. Speaker, let me conclude. Yeah, no, no, not that. I, no, let me make this point, and I hope I don't have to do this again, or any other chair I might have to do this. I know sometimes these debates get heated, but statements like member, member like you and, and back and forth, I think you have to be careful. I mean, well, the mem and, 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 the, and the reference. I, I, I know there's words getting thrown back and forth. I know there's words getting thrown back and forth. Pine Ridge, please carry on. But, you know, c come on, man. I don't mind to, I don't, it's not my intention, you know, but sometimes I'm very provoked by a person sitting in their seat. Okay. Mr. Deputy, Grand Bahama is in need of. Assistant yes. in terms of its airport. I also want to bring to it the, the air traffic control tower, which I believe is also now under the ministry. Yeah. The air traffic control tower is in an atrocious state, dilapidated. Persons are having difficulty uh, getting up to the top of that tower, having to walk because the air condition has been broken down, the elevators have been broken down for some time. The meteorological center is also there, and they're also having uh, a very bad working environment for them to work with and to work in. And so I would, I would really appreciate it if the minister would seek to assist and relieve the persons of their work environment by trying to see to it that some kind of help is brought about, brought about for them. Also, the firemen, they've been working in the elements ever since Doreen, until now, still working in the elements. Those conditions are atrocious, and I don't think any one of us in here would wish to work in such dilapidated conditions, and from Doreen to now has been a very long time. The fact that the airport even when it, we went to the first storm and then we were put into this tin building, Grand Bahama needs, its infrastructure needs to be, I hear you saying perhaps we need to get more land, but the infrastructure has to be in a way, perhaps we need to consider elevating so that the yeah, airport can be on a higher level and perhaps we need to be going to our planes from a, a second level so as to, yeah, when we have perhaps the waves of the, the ocean coming to, towards the land, perhaps we won't have such damages that the whole airport will have to close down for every time, okay? Um, so we do need to have elevation. Grand Bahama feels neglected. No airport, no jobs, no hotel, 
no economic advancement, just a bunch of no. And Grand Bahama really deserves the attention of this government, especially for how this island in particular has been very good to this governing party. And based on how it has been so good to them over the years, not just in this election. This is why Grand Bahama is so disappointed. They feel that you owe them more, that you ought to give them more, and that they ought to be more of a priority. So we do not envy all these new hotel, um, all these new airports that you're building in Long Island, Exuma. They have a right to it. But Grand Bahama, based on its population and based on its contribution to the consolidated funding, ought to be more of a priority than it has been. Pine Ridge Rest and Pine Ridge Encouragement. One more thing. One more thing. When we came in here, when we came in here, we were very excited. Minister, because the former government had done a tremendous job, a yeoman's job, actually, because it was difficult for them to have been able to discuss about being able to control its airspace. It was a major achievement. And I would have thought that we would have been further along in that area. And I tend to concur with Engelstead that I see that also as a part of the natural resources, our airspace. And so I hope it is more than us just trying to collect funding, but that we can get to the point where it's beyond just collecting funding, but it's about being able to see the advancement, as she indicated, of Bahamians in that area and seeing that we actually do control our airspace as to who can enter and who cannot enter, and for us to be able to have total control. So it ought to be about more than just monetary receipt. Uh, it ought to be about something as a part of us as a sovereign nation. That's our sovereign space. Thank you, Pine Ridge Rest. And Pine Ridge commends you for the effort that you're making in the area of civil aviation. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Member for Pine Ridge. As many, the Chair now recognizes the Honorable Member for Yamakura. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I will not be long, so uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I rise to support uh, uh, the passing of the... Thank you very much, sir. Truly appreciate it. I rise in support of the good people of Yamakro uh, in, in supporting the passing of the compendium of bills that were laid. Speaking of that is the Civil Aviation uh, Bill 2021, the Civil Avi Aviation Authority, Bahamas Bill 2021, and the Air Navigation Services Authority Bill uh, 2021. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to commend uh, the member for Freetown for the comprehensive presentation on these bills. And I concur with the sentiments expressed. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to commend all of the House. I don't know if we realize that even though there's remonstration or disagreements back and forth, this compendium of bills, and I think the side of the support of them, represents an, an effort by the government to pass legislation that is supported. I think members in the community don't see that at the end of the day. We had the Parliamentary Elections Act that was uh, supported by all on Sunday. The Fisheries Amendment Bill and its regulations that were supported. There was a compendium of financial services bill, bills that were laid and passed. And there was also the Bail Amendment Act that was uh, supported by all on Sunday. So again, Mr. Speaker, despite the fact that there may be some who would say that the government is not doing anything, and this referring just to 
matters that are being moved to the House. Here we have an excellent representation of where there's agreement uh, across across the board on, on these bills. The speak, uh, speak, I pray for indulgence, just to make mention of uh, Ms. Rosie Williams. We were saddened in the Yamacraw community, especially on the Cromwell Boulevard trip, when Ms. Rosie Williams passed on the 9th of, of January 2021. She's a her son, Big Matt, or Latour Thompson, and the crew are avid supporters of myself. And I'm um, speaker sometimes, many times I run short <coughs> on cats, and they just come out and they take care of business. And so I extend sympathies to the family. Uh, we're going to have, with the proper social distancing and moving through, we're going to have a old, she's from Port Alcat Island, we're going to have an old style. Uh, Wait for her. So those persons who are interested to pass through, will send out the date. Also, my godson, Mr. Joshua Ambrista, uh, he got a 3.5 GPA in the first setting of this, this month, it's by COVID-19. And I would like to just give a shout out to Joshua uh, uh, for his accomplishments. Mr. Speaker, I also crave indulgence to speak to, I know in, the re in recent times, the Immigration Department has been in the news. Uh, I want to say to all and sundry that I trust the director, Mr. Clarence Russell, implicitly, and also to say that he is intricately, intricately interwoven in the contemporary transformation of the Immigration Department, Mr. Speaker. I can tell you that uh, this year, come in April, we the government the Bahamas would have spent some $30 million on the digitization of the immigration department. And what was so phenomenal about it, Mr. Speaker, when I came in, there were some difficulties that we experienced, but we were able, with the good assistance of the director and persons in immigration, to involve persons from civil society and industry on a steering committee to bring that, pro that process to fruition. So now we have timelines um, in the next week or so. Our technical people will be coming to the Bahamian people to tell them that very shortly you would be able to upload your applications from the comfort of your home and or from your office. And we not, we've gone cashless, but you know, we haven't changed a lot. So a person brings funds to the department to take it. No less a person than Mr. Fred Smith QC said to me, Ellsworth, uh, we're speaking very informally that you would face some pushback from persons, especially from the immigrant community, if we go cashless. And Mr. Speaker, they were elated not to have to go up on the hill with their funds, but stay at home, get their receipts sent to them, not having to pay for receipts that they should not pay for, for their letters, but pay online. And so we have the support of industry, uh, the immigrant uh, community and civil society. And I could say that the Honorable Member for Angleston commended me one day when she was able to go into the department, Monarch House, with a document, have them scan it, and leave with a document. And I was able to say to her that very shortly you will not even have to go into the department. So there's been all sorts of complaints. And you just asked in the community, my passport gone missing, my birth certificate, or my whole file went missing. So unable to address that, the Director of Immigration, Mr. Clarence Russell, has been working along with his team assiduously to do that and to bring taxes. The Mystery Shopper Program, Mr. Speaker, which doesn't involve immigration officers or anybody from the ministry per se. It's an independent group from civil society and from industry that were invited in to assess, obviously we're paying the person who's, who's, who's responsible for it. The persons are volunteering their time. They were so excited. They say, some person told me, Minister, I will give my time freely for this. So they're being on the gate. We know now that there are certain applications that they're monitoring straight from front to back in the, in the, in the, in, 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 in the institution. They're able to help us with our phone system. So we have to call in the providers to get that straight. And so there's this mystery shopper program, and I've said to them, you can assess the minister, the director, and everybody in the ministry. And so I was having a discussion with the deputy director, deputy director Duncanson, and somebody pointed. He said, Minister, we don't know whether or not that person was a mystery shopper. 
and it's serving with the involvement of the society or the community to greatly improve the service that we're doing. Mr. Speaker, there's ongoing professional development training. We're, we're linking with local and international bodies to give the contemporary training to our immigration officers. So and the use of force, use of firearms. Uh, when people hear me say the use of force, use of firearms, an immigration officer is a diplomat. And he's also, he's also empowered because he has the powers of police officer with the, right, with the power to take life. So that immigration office guarding us from securing the integrity uh, and, 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 and the national sovereignty in, of, of this country by the work that they do in front of terrorists, money launderers, or persons don't come into the Bahamas. And so we've been doing that training in terms of succession. We're now looking at our promotional exercise. And with the director, we have agreed that nobody could be promoted when you have young officers who have been trainee officers for more than five years. When you have officers who have not gotten their confirmatory letters and they're, they're whispering, Minister in the corner, can I see you for a second? I haven't gotten this. And so, everyone, and, and then ACR, he said, that you cannot have a promotion where, you, where the junior officer wants to be promoted like the senior officer. So we're going, we're going through that process. It, 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 it's an assessment of, of an assessment of the working uh, appraisal of the officer's uh, performance while in the organization. Thank you very much. For the first time in the history of immigration, and I know I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, we're going to do a public symposium, right? For the public to sit in and listen to some of the topics, let me tell you. Immigration and human rights. Immigration and information technology. So when we stand out, and we're not going to get persons, for, we're going to get persons from immigration, but persons from industry. Immigration and financial services are in a, a significance there too. Because we know, separate and aside from the movement of assets, you are people. And our young immigration officer told me that Minister Johnson, the trajectory or the direction in which the country will take is based on how we treat with immigration. When you talk foreign direct investment, the movement of people, this is what it is. I was the person say that we're granting work permits to first. But let me tell you this, what we have done. And when our technical persons come to speak to the community very shortly, and I told them you will go out, you'll make a, a presentation to cabinet. Uh, the opposite, we're going to do it to the opposition, and we're going to do it uh, parliamentary caucus, and everybody was here. We're connecting with uh, Interpol, FIU, so that when Mr. Franklin Wilson has a project in Elutra, and he sells a piece of property, he can say, once you've stamped and recorded that document, right, and you want to apply for economic permanent residency, because our 50 we will do it. We can give you a provisional approval subject to our due diligence requirements. So once we put, let's say we put uh, Mr. Don Sanders name in there. Very instantly, the computer check yours. FIU, Interpol, and you get it back. When you apply to places like Canada, Dubai, you don't have to go there to apply for something. You upload it. Very shortly, you get a response. That is the level of efficiency with which we're driving the institution. And who is leading that separate from the minister? Who is leading that separate from the minister? You have the director of immigration, Mr. Clarence Russell, working very hard. And you know, I've heard persons say to me, Minister, we just don't want you to say it because you've been talking. Because when you say it, we then tell it to the international community. And the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And so we want to see it happening. So these are just some of the things, Mr. Speaker, that we've, we've been doing uh, in the immigration department of possible promotion. You know, persons have complained about what was happening around the department. We have cameras now. So we can see the parking lot. We can see the one across the road. The ones is there. We don't want no young ladies in the in the in the stairwell. And let me let me just stick a pin right there while I come to young ladies. I ain't getting into all of the personalities. I said when I'm I'm going to campaign now and I see the young gentleman uh, that's gonna come, you know from the side opposite, an old gentleman say, that's why I don't normally ask politicians to do anything. 
but I want you to do this one thing for me, this one for Belinda. So I tell him I could do something for Belinda. Uh, but I want to say this, and I want to make it clear. When it comes to women and children, and for what I've been hearing, and for something I'm not calling any name, but you see whether it be real or fictional, whenever I hear about the abduction, the abuse of women and children, or the purported rape of women and children, Yamakura and the young man, that, well, I ain't so young no more, the man from Dow, want to say, unless they were totally frivolous, something should have been done. And you don't be my friend, like I tell you, if you don't take care of your children. You don't be my friend if you beat women. You go get your counseling and all those different things. You don't be my friend and you don't hang around me if I hear you trying to rape women. Even in the prison, that is not accepted. And don't talk with children. My daughter just celebrated a five-year-old birthday. I got a 27-year-old. I got a 17-year-old. And when, if you mess with my children, I want my daughters came home one night. After 12, I say, darling, let me tell you something. After 12, I only expect my mother didn't get out and my auntie didn't get out. And my father's dead. So I'm only expecting intruders after 12. I said, you know how daddy feel about intruders. We didn't have that problem anymore. And I see those type of people as intruders. Intruders on the innocence of women and children. And I think that don't get into the personalities. You know, who, what? The mayor of fact, and I want, to com I want to commend women like Dr. Sandra Dane Patterson, uh, Ms. Nichols, uh, all those women who have been out there talking about what's happening in our community. I decry it. I feel shameful. And so I get up tonight to say, I don't agree with that. And, you, and if you was my friend, clear it up quick. Because we ain't gonna be no friends no more. But I'm very concerned about what, 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 what is happening. I, I think the level of silence, and you don't have to get into politics about this, is too loud, Mr. Speaker. As so I want to say to the community, because persons have been calling me saying, you're firing the director? No. He's intricately involved in the contemporary transformation of the immigration department. And I have an open door policy, and people know that, even for the president of the, of, yeah, of, of the thing. And so if anybody wants to have any justifiable reason, they say that he is not performing his duty, they just come and say it. But don't just say, we must fire somebody when there is cogent, I put cogent facts on the table of what he's been doing. Come to work, don't disappear for a year. And one time he was very furious. How could a man be charged before the court, man? And we can't fire him? How oh, is that possible? How do we find files where people commit crimes abroad and, and get off the, 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 the restricted list and back in the Bahamas? How is that possible? And just like the American charge said, if you could put a box of dope on the plane, you could put a bomb. If people could sleep going, transfer, I mean, Fresh crossing the border with no checks, and terrorists could come across. So, Mr. Speaker, I do support the amendment of these bills, uh, which govern the regulations of our airspace, airport, and persons who pilot, uh, pilot the pilot these, these airplanes. So, Mr. Speaker, I said I wouldn't be long. I just wanted to say that to speak to lend Yamakura support to it to also highlight the positioning of the uh, distinguished director of immigration, and to also say, I had to come and say tonight, with this thing with women and children and girls, it ain't good. It's riled me up. And I don't like, it's parbo. I don't <laughs> like it. And so, the level of silence, and, and if, Mr. Speaker, if it is real and we did absolutely nothing, and we did absolutely nothing, we're wrong. If it is a figment of our imagination, we have to try and clear it up. But I need preachers, pastors, 
this side and the side opposite to say something. And I just thought I had to say that because my daughter, my youngest daughter, celebrated her, her fifth birthday last night. And when I tell you last, we're going to come to maturing. I'm the boss, and they know that. I submit, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. As many, the chair recognizes the member for the, the chair recognizes the member for Central South Abaco. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, we've had a very lengthy and productive debate here today, so I'll be very brief as I lend my support. One, one second, please. Um, South Central. I'll be very brief, Mr. Deputy. Uh, just one second. Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Honorable Member for Central and South Abaco. The Chair recognize the member for Central and South Abaco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I will be very brief here tonight as I stand here on behalf of the good people of Central and South Abaco to lend our support to the compendium of bills before us here today. Uh, I note, Mr. Speaker, as a junior member of the House, I take note from senior members, and tonight I take note from my good friend and colleague, the member for Central and South Andrus and Mangrove Key. When he spoke to the importance of airports in our family islands, they are, as he said, I believe, I'll paraphrase, you only have so many chances for a good first impression, Mr. Speaker. And our airports, especially in the family island, particularly if you have an international airport, they are your first port of entry. They are your primary facilitator of visitors not just for your returning citizenry. So having an airport is an important cultural and psychological thing, I believe, Mr. Speaker. The Leonard Thompson International Airport, the airport in Marsh Harbor, International Airport, uh, has seen better days, Mr. Speaker. It was damaged in Hurricane Dorian. Uh, and I believe I'm drawing correctly from the source of information. If I stand to be corrected by the member for Freetown, if otherwise, but that $3 million has been available for uh, repair and refurbishment to the main terminal. And once again, I stand to be corrected, Mr. Speaker, uh, an additional figure of approximately $5 million for what I'll refer to as peripheral structures, uh, the tower, the uh, customs cargo hangar uh, and other such on sundry. So I want to reassure my people, people of Central and South Abaco, that uh, as their member, and I believe as this administration, once again drawing from the good member for Central and South Andrus, how important and impactful an international airport is in these family islands. They're a symbol. They're very important, uh, and their state reflects that of the pride of the people. So I want to reassure my constituents, Mr. Speaker, that uh, I'm doing all I can, and I do not presume to speak for the member for Freetown, but as he has given his assurance here today, that all is being done to uh, revitalize the Leonard Thompson International Airport to one that Albuquerqueans can be truly proud of, because it is it is ours, Mr. Speaker, and it's a very important... Uh, I remember before I was in politics, the construction and unveiling of the airport named after a local hero, Leonard Thompson, Captain Thompson. Uh, it's a point of pride to have an international airport, so I want to reassure all my constituents that no expense is being spared in revitalizing that very important symbol, that very important piece of infrastructure that belongs to us as a community. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the technical nature of the bill would have been debated uh, thoroughly at this point by 
members of both sides. And I believe the member for Freetown did an excellent presentation breaking down some of the vernacular and technical aspects of the bill, understanding that this is can be cut and dry matters, but I'm happy the debate tonight has been so lively. Uh, this is about modernizing our aerospace and reclaiming sovereignty. I believe are two key features that we've heard throughout this evening from both sides, to be perfectly frank, Mr. Speaker. So I just want to speak, wanted to speak to those aspects, speaking of airports, and moving forward as we look into public-private partnerships in terms of management and expansion of our family island airports, I think that's a terrific idea. And I believe most of my constituents would agree that having a public-private sector partnership for the management and the expansion of our airports, and something that Long Island mentioned earlier here this afternoon, something that we have an opportunity to have ownership in, to have skin in the game. I think that's a very important thing, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I look forward to that coming to fruition somewhere down the line. But I'm happy to hear in the interim, like I mentioned, that no funds are being spared in terms of revitalizing our airport. So, Mr. Speaker, I promised I would be very brief, as I believe uh, Freetown will close after I speak, that this is something that, and I, I do not call her name often or do not name the member often, but I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, as we all would have recognized here tonight, Angliston had made significant contributions towards where we all want to be today. And where Freetown had mentioned, it's, it's about, not about who did what, but getting to where we need to be as a nation and as a country. So I give credit where credit is due, and I give credit to the member for Freetown because he has taken up uh, Yeoman's work in getting us where we need to be. So I want to thank the Honorable House and all the members here tonight uh, for the opportunity to speak and wanted to relay that very important information to my constituents and to make it known that Central and South Abaco supports this compendium of bills as we speak to modernize and reclaim ownership of our aerospace and our aviation industry and all those who practice it uh, and all and sundry that come under uh, that carriage, Mr. Speaker, for lack of a better word. So once again, Central and South Abaco supports this compendium of bills and thanks the chair and the, Mr. Speaker for the opportunity to speak here tonight on behalf of the good people of Central and South Abaco. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Freetown. Mr. Speaker, I, I never thought that this would go on this late, on these very uh, uncontroversial um, bills. But I am delighted to inform the House that I'm going to wrap up now and uh, try to be as, as brief as possible. First of all, Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the uh, staff of the Civil Aviation Authority. They were instrumental in making this a reality starting with Mr. Charles Bernard Benneby, who was the former Director General who retired in September. He's not doing very well this evening, so I want to send him my best wishes. Uh, he was able, he was um, uh, succeeded by Mr. Michael Allen and his team, and they are all, uh, he is doing an excellent job, motivated, fired up, got his team all excited about uh, implementing these new uh, pieces of legislation and preparing for the audit in November. And then I would be remiss if I didn't uh, thank uh, the chairman of the board of the Bahamas Civil, A uh, the Civil Aviation Authority, uh, uh, Mrs. Wendy Craig, who has served both, was appointed by my predecessor and has continued uh, on as chairman. Um, certainly in the uh, area of aviation, uh, there is no politics. Everybody is very professional and there is a certain continuity from one administration uh, to another. There aren't that many aviation specialists and and we end up uh, uh, we end up using them um, uh, uh, across administration. I don't want to be uh, controversial uh, at all, but just very briefly to talk about the airspace. Uh, everybody talks about this flight information region. 
and the, uh, the desire for the Bahamas to get a flight information region, I have the same desire. There's no doubt I have the same desire. And when I came to office and I spoke to ICAO, ICAO politely informed me that it ain't happened. So I tried. I tried, I spoke to them, and they said, certainly the, the gentleman who was in the uh, FIR department at ICAO uh, said that in his time, 30 years that he'd been there, he had only created three FIRs in 30 years, and generally they were in areas of conflict. So, for example, when Sudan split into two countries and they were fighting amongst each other, they created one for the North and one for the South. Um, so, after 48 years of trying to get an FIR, we've, we've tried since independence, I presume, well, I think from independence we've tried. Um, but, okay, well, the last 20 years. No, no, no. So, and, and I, I, thought, I thought it was important. I, no, no, no. I, I thought it was important. I, ICAO, I went to them. I spoke to ICAO. ICAO told us we are quite happy with the operators of the FIRs. Well, that's what they told me. And, and well, so my, my view was let us monetize it. Let's start to earn some revenue from it so we could build capacity and therefore we could uh, begin to present the case that we now have the capacity to do so because our uh, air traffic control service really only extends 40 miles from LPIA. It doesn't extend throughout the whole Bahamas. It only goes to 11,000 feet. So there would have to be a significant investment in creating our FIR. And while I, I support, I figure let's start to earn revenue from it and then we could we could look at look at look look at creating that FIR. But um, <clears throat> as it relates to uh, legislation, uh, the score is 60 percent. Hopefully, with this amendment, we can take it up above 90 percent. Um, the runway lights. There was the implication. I don't know if that was right. I heard the good member say about it that the gentleman who ended up uh, crashing, I think, off Love Beach and, and, and sadly passing. Um, there was, an, there was a sort of implication that had the runway lights been operationalized or on in the family islands, um, then that might have led to uh, the the a better outcome. Um, uh, I I, uh, I was of uh, you know when let me, let me just finish the point and then you can you uh, can you can I, I I was of the view in the family islands the runway lights are off generally they're kept off and turned on when there's an emergency. So you have to advise the designated person, whether it's a police officer or the airport manager, that there's an impending emergency. They have to locate that person, they have to go down to the airfield, and they have to turn on the lights. So that's generally how the Family Island lighting system works after dark in order to not encourage nefarious activities, which may happen in the Family Islands if we were to leave the lights on. That is the excuse that was given to me. But I'll stay. Mr. Chair, recognize the Honorable Member for English, sir. Mr. Speaker, no, what the, the member, I think, misunderstood me. What I said was this, that when that happened, that it was said that he was trying to find a runway. You were then asked at that time about the condition of runway lights, and it was your response to that. And I said, having been asked that question in conjunction with the circumstances, that's what I said. I didn't give any implication. I thought I was very clear on that. Okay. Point taken. Um, <coughs> as it relates to the North Andrus Airport and uh, the fact that there are trailers down on the ground, um, Mr. Speaker, just very briefly, I mean, we've hashed this over about three or four times in the House. The, uh, the person from whom the government of the Bahamas was renting from, we were paying him $60 a square foot. Now, the government has a, a, a limit at $25 per square foot, generally, that it likes to keep to. And I can't for the life of me understand why that landlord won't rent us at $25 a square foot. I recently went there and the building's empty. I mean, we would have been happy to rent his building at $25 a square foot. It wasn't as if there was a huge demand. It's just, I, I just couldn't understand why he was holding out for $60 a square foot, which is more than the Ministry of Tourism pays for their office in the Hilton on Bay Street. So I, I just thought the price, I just thought the price, I just thought the price was outrageous. Uh, I, uh, I didn't uh, understand uh, why. Member. Oh, Member Congressman, on a point of order. So a clarification. What I what I was speaking to, um, Mr. Speaker, is the fact of the obligation of a government to build an airport or to look to building an airport. And what I said was that the minister did not even put his mind to that. He he sought to bring a what he thought was a scandalous scenario. And and with me, he, he got to be joking. A scandalous scenario. 
And, and I, what I said was that he ought to have been looking as Minister of Aviation to address the airport needs of that community. I said we'll go renting nobody premises. I'm saying if you were so interested in North Andros and so appalled by what was happening there, that it was really incumbent upon you to find a respectable solution to the dilemma of the people of North Andros. That's what I was saying. <coughs> I feel that I have. Clearly you disagree, but that's fine. Um, the final uh, issue that I'm going to um, uh, discuss uh, is uh, many of the Family Island members um, uh, uh, expressed the desire for there to be significant investment in their airports. And just to sensitize the Bahamas or anybody who will be listening, there are 28 airports in the Family Island, all in various states of disrepair or need some work. Right, so the government of the Bahamas, I think my, my predecessor would have had a study done by a company called Stantec, which would have identified probably close to $200 million worth of repairs that needed to be done uh, in the Family Island airports. And that was not assuming, that was assuming far lower amounts than we are going to invest in Exuma, far lower amounts than we are going to invest in, 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 in North Eleuthera, so, and Long Island. So I would think, Mr. Speaker, that it probably, the bill is probably $300 million to fix all these airports to get everybody happy. So it is, obviously, we're a small country of 400,000 people. We've got 28 airports. We're probably in the, pro we're in the process of trying to acquire another airport in Grand Bahama. We've heard everybody complain about the state of that, the need for significant investment. Um, so the government is trying to explore creative ways to get private sector investment in assisting the government in redeveloping these airports and bringing the amount of investment that they need. So, and then finally, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'd like to close with, uh, with an article uh, from the Tribune dated December the, 17th, December the 7th, 2020. And it is an article written by Neil Hartnell. And the headline says, double aviation score to be a serious player. An aviation law specialist, and I'll quote, an aviation law specialist says the Bahamas must double its safety and regulatory audit score to achieve a brighter future and be treated as a serious international player in the sector. Llewellyn Boyer Cartwright told Tribune Business that this nation won't get anywhere in developing its aviation industry to its true potential unless it dramatically improves the rock bottom score it received on its last International Civil Aviation Organization ICAO audit. Branding aviation sector reform a Herculean task. Mr. Boyer Cartwright, a noted aviation lawyer, said the government was spot on with the three strong bill package it hopes to present to the House of Assembly early in 2021, but he warned time is of the essence. With ICAO examiners due to reassess the Bahamas in November 2021, he argued it was critical the Bahamas Civil Aviation Authority be given every day possible to demonstrate it has implemented the new bills and thereby address deficiencies that saw just this nation score 32% on critical elements of safety oversight system. Noting that the BCAA's own advisors were confident that the score can be doubled or improved 100%. This time round, Mr. Boyer Cartwright told this newspaper, it's paramount, it's critical, I can't imagine that we would get anywhere or anyone would pay attention to us without at least a rating in the 60s or higher. Mr. Boyer Cartwright suggested that aviation was one sector that held near-term economic diversification potential for the Bahamas in COVID-19's wake, but he warned that developing a world-class aircraft registry, as multiple administrations have been keen to do, and exploiting other job and revenue earning opportunities will be impossible without a much improved ICAO uh, evaluation. There's a lot of work ahead, but again, it's all there for the taking, he said. It's not as if this is new, a new invention. It's not novel. It might be novel for the Bahamas, but for other countries, but not, not for other countries. I'm so happy they, the government, are giving it the attention it deserves. And so, Mr. Speaker, on that note, I'd like to uh, support this, 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 this legislation and to close the debate. And I thank everybody for their contributions. And... Uh, Let's take it to the next step. Thank you. Oh, honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for a second time and committed. 
a bill for an act to provide for the continuation of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas as the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas. Its functions and composition and for matters connected thereto. As many members that are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for a second time and committed. The bill for an act to provide for the continuation of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas as the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas, its function and composition, and for matters connected thereto. For the second reading of bills. A bill for uh, the Civil Aviation Bill 2021, a bill for an act to repeal and replace. Oh, oh we did that one already, right? No. Oh, okay. we, the we, bill. I want to do the navigation. Oh, I can do the air navigation. navigation. Okay, yeah. Air navigation services. The Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Bill 2021, a bill for an act to establish a separate Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority with its functions and composition. Thank you. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for a second time and committed. A bill to establish a separate Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority with its functions and composition. As many members that are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will start. Order that the bill be read for a second time and committed. A bill to establish a separate Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority with its functions and composition. For the second reading of bills. Speaker, the Civil Aviation Bill 2021, a bill for an act to repeal and replace the Civil Aviation Act 2016 to modernize the regulation of civil aviation in the Bahamas in accordance with the Chicago Convention and for connected purposes. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for a second time and committed. A bill for an act to repeal and replace the Civil Aviation Act of 2016 to modernize the regulation of civil aviation in the Bahamas in accordance with the Chicago Convention and for connected purposes. As many members that are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for a second time and committed. A bill for an act to repeal and replace the Civil Aviation Act 2016 to modernize the regulation of civil aviation in the Bahamas in accordance with the Chicago Convention and for connected purposes. The second reading of bill. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Bamboo Town. Mr. Speaker, there are no further second reading. Mr. Speaker, I move that the House resolves itself into committee of the whole House to be to speak in the chair. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the House resolves itself into a committee of the whole House with the Deputy Speaker and Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House in the Chair. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those who oppose will stand. The House will now dissolve itself into a Committee of the Whole House with the Deputy Speaker and Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House in the Chair. recognizes the member for Southern Shores. Speaker, we will start with the, the chair. Yes. I'm trying to promote you. I, I, I <laughs> Mr. Chair, we, we will start with the Civil Aviation Authority and Bahamas Bill. I know that the long title. Wait, wait. Do you want a second, though? Second. Being moved and seconded that the long title of the bill be agreed. As many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The long title of the bill is agreed. Mr. Speaker, I move that the short title be agreed. 
Second. Being moved and seconded that the short tile of the bill be agreed. If any members that are in favor of being seated, those opposing would rise. Mr. Speaker, I move that clauses two through clauses 32 be agreed. Being moved and seconded by clause two through 32 of the bill be agreed. If any members are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. Mr. Chair, <laughs> we've already agreed the, the, the clauses. Yeah. I think you did clause two through 32. Yes. Which is exclusive of the sorry, mm -hmm. schedule. schedule. Uh, yes. <laughs> Don't, mind, you Don't rush Mister, the member. Don't rush the member. Mr. Chair, I move that day. Schedule be agreed. Is it schedule, is it? Is it, which bill is this? The civil aviation bill? Yes, ladies, authority. Authority bill. It's only one, it's only one schedule. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's being, do I have a seconder? Yes. It's being moved and seconded that the schedule of the bill be agreed. As many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The schedule of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I move that the bill in, in its entirety be agreed. Second. Being moved and seconded that the bill in its entirety be agreed. As many members that are in favor of being seated, those opposing will rise. The bill is agreed in its entirety. Mr. Chair, we move to the Air Navigation Services Authority Bill. I move that the long title be agreed. Second. Being moved and seconded that um, the chair recognizes the member for Freetown. There's a little typo in the long title. It just says a bill to establish. It should say a bill for an act to establish. So we could amend that. It's being moved and seconded that the long title of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor will remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The long title of the bill is agreed as amended. Mr. Chair, I move that the short title be agreed. Second. Being moved and seconded that the short title of the bill be agreed. As many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The short title of the bill is agreed. Okay. Mr. Chair, I move that clause two be agreed. Being moved, being moved and seconded. The chair recognizes the member for Freetown. Uh, just two little typos uh, in clause two, Mr. Speaker. Uh, under the definition CAB, C A A B, on page four, it says means the Civil Aviation Authority bill continued under the Section three of the Civil Aviation Authority Bill Act, it says 2020, it should say 2021. And right under that, it says Civil Avi Avi Aviation Act means the Civil Aviation Act. It says 2020, it should say 2021. So in those two instances, just change it to 2021. Under the slip rule? Yeah. Okay. Being moved and seconded that clause two be amended, be, accept, be uh, accepted as amended. As many members that are, that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. Clause two of the bill is accepted as amended. Mr. So Chair, I move that clause three through clause 28 be agreed. Being moved and seconded that clause three through 28 of the bill be agreed. Many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposed will rise. Clause two, clause three through 28 of the bill is agreed. Mr. So Chair, I move that the schedule of the bill be agreed. Second. Being moved and seconded that the schedule of the bill be agreed. Many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The schedule of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I move that the bill in its entirety be agreed. As, as amended? As amended. Correct. It's being moved and seconded that the bill in its entirety be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. The bill is agreed in its entirety as amended. Mr. Chair, we now go to the Civil Aviation uh, Bill 2021. I move that the long title be agreed. Okay. Being moved and seconded that the long title of the bill be agreed. Many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The long title of the bill is agreed. 
Mr. Chair, I move that this short title and commencement be agreed. Second. Being moved and seconded that the short title, short, short, title. short title of the bill be agreed. As many members that are in favor of being seated, those opposing will rise. The short title of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I move that uh, clauses two through four be agreed. Being moved and seconded that clause two through four of the bill be agreed. As many members that are in favor of being seated, those opposing will rise. Clause two through four of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I move that clause five be agreed. The chair recognizes the member for Freetown. Speaker, I beg leave to propose that the following amendment be made in clause five in subsection two. Insert the word Bahamas after the word authority. Second. Being moved and seconded that clause five, the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor of being seated, those opposing will rise. Clause five, the bill is, ag is, is agreed as amended. Mr. Chair, I move that clauses six through 21 be agreed. Second. Being moved and seconded that clause six through 21 of the bill be agreed. Many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposed will rise. The bill is a clause six through twenty-one of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I move that clause twenty-two is agreed. Chair recognizes the member from Freetown. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I beg leave to propose the following amendment to clause twenty-two in subsection four. Delete the word appeal and substitute the word objective. I second. Been moved and seconded that clause two of the bill be agreed. 20, sorry, clause 22 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members are in favor of being seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 22 of the bill is agreed as amended. Mr. Chair, I move that clauses 23 through 25 be agreed. Second. Being moved and seconded that clause 23 through 25 of the bill be agreed. As many members are in favor of being seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 23 through 25 of the bill is agreed. Mr. Chair, I move that clause 26 of the bill be agreed. Being, the chair recognizes the member for Freetown. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I beg leave to propose that the following amendment be made to clause 26. Renumber the last appearing subsection 4 as subsection 5. Second. Being moved and seconded that clause 26 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. Clause 26 of the bill is agreed as amended. Mr. Chair, I move that clauses 27 and 28 be agreed. <coughs> the Chair recognizes the member for Freetown. Uh, in clause 20, uh, Mr. Chairman, I beg leave to propose the following amendment in clause 28. In the definition of person directly affected, A, delete the word error, reference source not found, and substitute the number 44. <laughs> <laughs> And in B, and B, delete the words appeal or objection and substitute the words object or appeal. Where it's so that's in clause 28, sitting clause 28. So delete the words appeal or objection yes. and substitute the words object or appeal. Second. Being moved and seconded to clause 27 and 28 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members are in favor of being seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 27 and 28 of the bill is, amend is agreed as amended. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Chair, I move that clauses 29 and 30 be agreed. Sorry, Mr. Chair, recognize the member for Freetown. Mr. Chairman, I beg leave to propose the following amendment be made to clause 30. In subsection 4, delete the words appeal against and substitute the words object to and delete the words section 33 and substitute the word section 34. Being moved and seconded that clause 28, 29, and 20, the 30 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing rise. Clause 29 and 30 of the bill is agreed as amended. Mr. So Chair, I move that clause 31 be agreed. Chair recognizes the member for Freetown. Chairman, I beg leave to propose the following amendment to clause 31 in subsection 4 to leave the word appeal and substitute the words objective. Being moved and seconded that clause 31 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 31 of the bill is, agree is, as, is agreed as amended. 
Mr. Chair, I move that clause 32 be agreed. Chair recognizes the member for Freetown. In subsection O, oh, Mr. Chairman, I beg leave to propose the following amendment be made in section in clause 32. In subsection 4, delete the word appeal and substitute the words object to. It's being moved and seconded that clause 32 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 32 of the bill is agreed, as amended. Mr. Chair, I move that clause 33 be agreed. Chair recognizes the member for Freetown. Four more to go, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I beg you to propose the following amendment be made to clause 33. In subsection 2E, <coughs> delete the word 34 and substitute the number 44. Second. Being moved and seconded that clause 33 of the bill be agreed, as amended. As many members are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 33 of the bill is agreed as amended. Mr. So Chair, I move that clause 34 be agreed. Chair recognizes three now. Chairman, I beg leave to propose the following amendment to clause 34 in subsection 1, delete the word appeal and substitute the words object to. Second. Um, it's being moved and seconded that clause 34 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 34 of the bill is agreed as amended. Mr. So Chair, I move that clauses 35 through 45 are agreed. Mr. Chair recognizes free now. Uh, Mr. Chair, I beg leave to propose the following amendment to clause 45 in subsection 2C. Roman numeral two, delete the word time and substitute the word fine, F-I-N-E. <laughs> Being moved and seconded that clause 35 to 45 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. Clause 35 to 45 of the bill is agreed as amended. One more, one more. Mr. Speaker, I move that clauses 47 through no, 46, 46. 46. 46, sorry, through 60 is agreed. Chair recognizes the member for Freetown. Mr. Chairman, I beg leave to propose the following amendment to clause 60 in paragraph D, delete the words number of 1976 and substitute the words open parentheses, capital S, period, capital I, period, N-O number, period, 105 of 1976. Second. Yeah. Being moved and seconded that clause 46 through 60 of the bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. Clause 46 through 60 of the bill is agreed as amended. Mr. Chair, this bill has no schedule, so I move that the bill in its entirety be agreed. As amended. As amended. As amended. Be agreed as amended. Okay. Being moved and seconded that the bill that this bill be agreed as amended. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. The bill is agreed in its entirety as amended. <laughs> Chair recognize the South and Shore. Um Mr. Chair, I move that the Speaker will now take the chair. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the speaker now do take the chair. As many members that are in favor remain seated. Those opposing will rise. The Honorable Speaker will now take the chair. I think I beg leave to report that the Committee of the Whole has gone through the bills, making amendments thereto. Honorable Members, the Deputy Speaker and Chairman of the Committee of the Whole House has reported that the Committee of the Whole House 
has gone through the three bills, having made amendments thereto. Third reading and passing of bills. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Southern Shores. Mr. Speaker, um, I want to move that these bills be read the third time and passed, but I want to ask my colleagues to hold applause until uh, we, we complete it. The first one will be the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> will be an act, uh, a bill for an act to provide for the continuation of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas as the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas, its functions and composition and for matters connected thereto. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for a third time and pass. A bill for an act to provide for the continuation of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas as the Civil Aviation Authority Bahamas, its functions and composition and for matters connected thereto. As many members are in favor, will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for a third time and pass. A bill for an act to provide for the continuation of the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas as the Civil Aviation Authority of the Bahamas its functions and the composition of the modest community. Order that the bill do now pass and the title thereof be declared to be the Civil Aviation Authority, Bahamas Act 2021. For the third reading and passing of bills. Mr. Speaker, I move for a third reading and passing of a bill for an act to establish a separate Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority with its functions and composition. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be, re be read for a third time and passed. A bill to establish a, a separate Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Correct. with its functions and composition. As many members that are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for a third time. A bill for an act to establish a separate Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority with its functions and composition. Order that the bill do now pass and the title thereof be declared to be the Bahamas Air Navigation Services Authority Act 2021. Further third reading and passing of bills. Chair recognizes the honorable member for Southern Jaws. Mr. Speaker, I move for third reading and passing of a bill for an act to repeal and replace the Civil Aviation Act 2016 to modernize the regulation of civil aviation in the Bahamas in accordance with the Chicago Convention and for connected purposes. Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the following bill be read for a third time and pass. A bill for an act to repeal and replace the Civil Aviation Act 2016 to modernize the regulation of civil aviation in the Bahamas in accordance with the Chicago Convention and for connected purposes. As many members that are in favor will remain seated, those who oppose will stand. Order that the bill be read for the third time. A bill for an act to repeal and replace the Civil Aviation Act 2016 to modernize the regulation of civil aviation in the Bahamas in accordance with the Chicago Convention for Connected Purposes. Order that the bill do now pass and the title thereof be declared to be Civil Aviation Act 2021. No further third readings. I still must ask. Transformative. Third reading and passing of bills. For the third reading and passing of bills. No further, no further third readings. Thank you, Honorable Member. Consideration of Senate amendments. Resolutions. 
<laughs> member statements, appointments of select committees, instructions to select committees, discharge of select committees, notices for future meetings. The chair recognizes the honorable member for Mangrove Key, South and Central Andrews. Uh, speaker, I would like to direct it to reflect on this day as we clapped and celebrated that know that Her Majesty's loyal opposition has 100% attendance here this evening. All day. All day. All day. All day. We all sat all day. We sat all day with our leader. All day with our leader. All day. After a, gro after a glorious evening last evening, we stand this evening with our leader this evening. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I would I would let my leader and the member for Monk Bray have words with him later on this evening. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Speaker, as we have had a very good day today, and not a very adversarial day, I would say the fact that we have accomplished much, and all notices, in the name of the loyal opposition, are renewed and remain as established on prior notices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Member. Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Southern Shores. Mr. Speaker, as, as I renew all notices in the name of the government, I want to advise uh, my friend from the side opposite that the government of the Bahamas is multitasking. Uh, so those people we can see is about the people's business. Yes. I get notice, Mr. Speaker, of the after upon the adjournment that the House will meet on Wednesday, 10th February at 10 a.m. <laughs> uh, honorable members. It has been moved and seconded that the House adjourns to 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 10th of February 2021. As many members are in favor, remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. Final adjournment. Mr. Speaker, I move that the business of this House adjourns until Wednesday, 10th February 2021 at 10 a.m. Second. <laughs> we'll be, dis you'll be, you'll we'll be uh, discussing Valentine. You'll be given due and timely notice. <laughs> Honorable members, it has been moved and seconded that the House adjourns to 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 10th of February, 2021. As many members that are in favor will remain seated, those who oppose will sign. It's ordered that the House is adjourned until 10 a.m. Wednesday, the 10th of February, 2021.